Well, I'm about ready to get started with just some general discussion. Um, and I'm also going to ask for some inputs from you guys as to what your backgrounds are and so I can kind of adjust my style to um, serve everybody the best. Because I'm an electrical engineer that does a lot of software, I kind of work the whole spectrum. But people from, that come to SciPy are from a much even wider spectrum of um, software development and backgrounds. But from an electrical engineering standpoint, I'm kind of, I, my tradition is signal processing and communications. And here that's called my domain or domain specific area, just like we might have a mechanical engineer, right? Or we might have a um, bioengineer, or, you know, I could have everybody introduce themselves and tell me what their discipline is, but I don't think I'll do that. But um, I want to try to give the right perspective to give every, make everybody feel comfortable, because I know um, if I was talking to my students in my discipline, I would just blow them away with lots of intimate mathematical modeling details, and that's not going to fly here. But I want to give you enough of it, and I want to try to morph my wording around to connect well because um, data science I take as being kind of the central theme of the SciPy conference so I can make this seem like data science if I want to um, but in a, in, a, in an abstract way so it's 131 according to my watch um, Welcome to this session on a signal processing and communication hands-on using this new package, Scikit DSP-COM, which um, is not new, but it's newly pushed up as of um, spring break this past semester. I first came to SciPy two years ago, and it was right after my, my book, Signal Processing for Dummies, had come out. And when I was writing that book, I developed the beginnings of this package using Python because of my philosophy being that I wanted to be able to, I guess I should stand closer to the microphone if that helps, but the electronics I put down here that I said I should not kick is right here as well. Um, I wanted to provide software for engineers and signal processing people around the world to use for free and I didn't want to have them say use MATLAB because that would force them into bootlegging software, and I don't believe in that. So, and I, I, I work with a lot of different people from around the world, and people always find their software, whether they find it legally or not. So, I didn't want to be um, leading people into doing things like that. So, that got me started in it. That's kind of part of the, the who am I and where have I. Um, come from. So my tradition, though, like I've said earlier, is, as an electrical engineering professor, um, I teach in the sub-discipline called communications and signal processing. Um, originally, I developed hardware and was a board level designer a long time ago. But as time goes on, um, you instantiate a circuit board of electronics, just like you'd instantiate an object in software, right? Most of you understand that really well, but to me, as I now look back through time, I say a piece of hardware that's on a you know, PCB is an instantiation, right? It's sitting there, and now it's a resource that I use, and today's way of doing things with the software-defined radio is I've instantiated that hardware plug it in and now I have the flexibility of using that one piece of hardware in many different ways by writing um, software to accomplish different means and in the government sector it's very big um, in the commercial sector it's also very big because what do our cell phones do they're multi-mode so they have to they have to work in a lot of different um, networks and different cell towers and th or different um, technologies on the cell site so that's a little bit more about who am I, and um, I've already said a little bit about the Scikit DSP com history. That's the second bullet point there, and I think we'll um, 
now start overviewing the, the topics that I'm planning on covering. So um, that comes up here in just a second, but this is the overview of the overview in a sense. We're also going to have in this very first um, portion of the tutorial, which I'm calling part zero, and maybe that just seems like, why would you start at zero? I don't know. But you do that in software, right? In Python, you start in an index of an array at zero, so that's like this is the beginning, and the first real thing is one, so I called it part zero. A few textbooks are like that that I teach out of. Has anybody ever used a textbook that has chapter zero? Okay, it's the exact same idea. So, so that's my reasoning behind that. Um, the first lab, though, is going to involve some basic speech processing. It's pretty exciting, but it doesn't require any, anything from the package. It's just basic Python. But it is going to involve get us up and running with Pi Audio and if um, you won't necessarily need to use this little dongle that I have, and I have several copies to hand out and loan out if some people want to try out a dongle um, as another interface to the audio, it will involve using that as well to get us introduced and get over a few bumps in the road with regards to drivers and such. Um, so I already mentioned what is scikit-dsp-com. It started when I wrote the book. My publisher was kind, of, kind enough to send me 15 copies of the book. So not one for everybody. Not like everybody wants to read this cover to cover, but Chiranth, my assistant and graduate student, is going to take your name and you're going to, well, what, and stand up by the microphone, maybe just make sure everybody gets it clear how this is going to work. Because again, I don't want to take these back with me either. They were shipped yeah. from the publisher. So we're going to raffle them off. Um, just give me a name and a number between zero to ten thousand, and I will write a Python script to take the closest numbers, and we'll hand them out. Sound fair? And if you don't want it, don't sign up. Okay, but um. I'll tell you, it's not a book that sells a lot. It was a book that was commissioned. I didn't say I wanted to write one. They came to me and they said, will you write this? So I got paid in advance, but so far I've made no money beyond my advance. It's negative at this point, but it's just not a real hot seller because not everybody in the world wants to, um, to learn about this stuff. It's designed for a junior level, sophomore junior level introductory class in signals and systems. So it's fairly mathematical, but it, I do use Python and we'll probably look at the website support I have for that. So, let's see. So this is kind of an outline of what's in the book. This is a flow chart and the red areas are the special interest areas. So we will start the process of the tutorial by developing a little background on continuous time signals and systems and discrete time signals and systems because that is what underlies um, signal processing and communications. We'll look a little bit at the next red box down there is LTI system difference equation modeling. Now you're saying, oh, that sounds pretty mathematical, but difference equations are something that all of us use in our lives, whether we know it or not. So anybody um, think of an example of a difference equation in your life? Not like when I walk down the street, there's something going on, but anybody got an idea? Do you put money in the bank? Or in some savings vehicle. So what's the algorithm that's running when you put a deposit into a bank? Interest. Compound interest is running, right? And that's a difference equation. Ever thought about that? It says present value is the previous value times some factor plus an initial amount that you put in or amount that you add to your account. And in banking, you want that scaling factor to multiply by something that's, what, greater than one so that you're 
getting appreciating some interest. In signal processing, mostly we don't want that to happen because that would be an unstable system that would go unbounded and kind of blow things up. But um, it's the basis of digital filters, though, which is something that we need in um, the digital radio algorithms. Next cu couple of things that come down is a little bit on the spectrum of a signal, and I'm going to start very, very basically. But for a signals and systems engineer, just reading the book, it comes down to the Fourier transform of a signal. And you don't have to know Fourier transform theory in detail because scipy um, dot signal can do that for us. And it, underneath that is the fast Fourier transform, which I'm willing to bet, even if you're not an electrical engineering slanted person, you know, how many of you have heard of the fast, how many of you have never heard of the fast Fourier transform or FFT, the cameraman? Okay, so it's not, it's, it's something everybody's heard of, okay? Sampling theory, um, why do we need sampling theory? Because we're on a computer, right? We're not working with an analog circuit. We're taking everything into the computer, so a continuum of um, signal values becomes a, a stream of values or a sequence of numbers which is pervasive on, in everything we do on computers today. So that's needed. Um, and then um, another part of the book, which is on the Dummies website, is some case studies. There's two case studies on signal processing. And I'm kind of going to use bits and pieces of those in, later in the lecture or the tutorial. And then wireless communications, there's a couple of examples that are on the website. That's the free part of the book that they, they put up for me. And I'm not really going to use those specifically because I've got other things that we'll be looking at. And then there's a couple of control system examples because control systems is another part of the signals and systems stool, as I think of it. It's a stool that's composed of three legs, so it's got control systems, pure signal processing, and then communications type signal processing as the three stool legs, and that is the signals and systems, and then you build on top of that. Uh, I guess I should use my previewer in this continuous flow mode. Um, I don't do this very often. Does anybody know what menu it's under? I can do continuous, right? Yeah, continuous scroll. Okay. Okay, I'm going to just briefly mention the modules that are currently in the package. Um, this is just the alphabetical listing, coefficient to header. That is just an interface that I wrote, or I've written for when I teach real-time digital signal processing, and we'll touch upon that a little bit later. It's a means of taking filter designs and other types of um, data that I would like to put into a header file and then import or include in C code so that I have access and can implement or instantiate a filter in real time DSP on a microcontroller or DSP microprocessor. Um, C pops up here frequently, so don't be worried. I'm not going to have you program in C or anything, but it's just part of the way things get done. Digital Com has a lot of algorithms and receiver implementation ideas or in transmitter and some receiver things for digital communications waveforms. More stuff to be added. There's an LTE type of waveform. When I say LTE, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Why do you know that? Because when you turn on your cell phone, you see LTE. Does everybody know what LTE stands for? Long-term evolution? Yeah, that's right. Does that make sense? Um, there's 5G coming out, too, which is going to increase the data throughput. But yeah, LTE um, is long-term evolution. So, And that uses a particular type of digital modulation used, called orthogonal frequency division um, multiplexing, which relies upon the fast Fourier transform. So. 
that's in another class that I teach. The next module, FEC, CONV, or Convolve. Um, this is forward error correction using um, convolutional coding theory. That's kind of the core of coding theory that's used in a lot of devices. Coding, codes protect information from errors during transmission over the airwaves. So that's a module that, that implements encoders and decoders, and it implements rate one-half codes with soft decision decoding and puncturing and other things that show up in SATCOM and other standards. Does anybody know what convolutional codes are? Okay, I'm just asking that question so I don't ever go there. I don't, it's not in the tutorial, so I'm just mentioning what that is. Next two are, we are definitely gonna be using the FIR design helper and the IIR filter design helper. These two packages design two different types of digital filters of which will be used at the very end when we're doing, working with the software defined radio. They come up with coefficient sets which define a particular filter that might be used to pass or reject signals of interest. Their core is primarily back in scipy.signal, but I've just put wrappers on them and kind of put an interface on them to be more consistent and, and user-friendly for my purposes. So that's what they are. Multi-rate helper is to do multi-rate signal processing along with the filters. It's not fully developed, but it's partially there. We're not going to be using it, though. Opt FIR Pi is just something that I've taken from the GNU, a GNU radio module, which is a software-defined radio toolkit that has Python along with C++. So it has Python scripting that helps call in um, C++ modules. And they, this is a module that should be, or a function that should be um, in scipy.signal, but it's not. It's not there. So I put it in my package so I could design certain types of, of filters, which we'll look at. But it's, the power of it is harnessed by the package above, FIR Design Helper. Pi Audio Helper is to allow us to <clears throat> do real-time signal processing with Python. It's not going to be fast and slick like you might expect, but it, it is, um, it's got some nice attributes and it allows you to do all your programming in Python. So you can prototype things and you can play around with speech yeah. and music. RTL SDR Helper um, <coughs> harnesses and adds functions to, um, to work with the radio dongle. It has one function in that module that does interface with the package PI RTL SDR, and that's how we're going to capture signals off the radio dongle. SIGSYS Python is the main collection that was written for the book originally. It's got a large variety of specialized functions keyed off of examples in the book, but just core functions that I use, and you'll be doing some exercises out of it. Synchronization.py is synchronization for digital communications waveforms. And that gets touched upon briefly if we get time to do that. I have a bit of a passion over synchronization in digital communications because it's something that a lot of people think when they read textbooks is just automatic. But synchronization, what, what do you think? I'm just going to give you a kind of a layman's view on it. If you have a clock running over here, I transmit a signal, and I have a receiver over here that has its local clock. Are those two clocks ever going to be synchronous? What do you think? Assuming that there's no other side information, like connecting to GPS or something, they're not. They're going to drift relative to one another. So synchronization is an essential ingredient for digital comm. If you cannot synchronize, you do not get your bits. And if you don't get your bits, what are you? Not happy, right? No bits, not happy. No, no information, no whatever. So it's, it's, it's under the covers in um, communications theory to be able to synchronize. And in the beginning, when we did communications just with speech, our brains did all that synchronizing. Because when we hear audio sounds, we automatically interpret it, right? Whether it's a little bit distorted or not, our brains are extremely powerful. 
dumb digital communications doesn't know what to do if the bits aren't are scrambled because of not being um, synchronized properly. So I think about things like that, and you probably said, wow, somebody worries about that. And I guess most of us know with technology in different domains, right, we just are thankful some people worry about each there's somebody there to worry about something in each domain and things get done and because um, you can't specialize in everything. So um, this is an example from the book or just a figure that I made to say um, where is signal processing or what is it and where is it used. So I took a block diagram of a cell phone and I guess I was kind of thinking of an iPhone. Have a camera that has two dimensional signal processing in it. Um, temperature and light sensors and three axis accelerometers, that's signal processing. We have an audio codec that gets inputs from a preamp and a microphone. We have the audio codec sending things out to the headphone, um, audio out or speaker out um, on our cell phones. And that, that particular area, this area kind of right in here, exactly what we also have on our laptop computers and what's inside the little dongle that you can get for 650 on Amazon. This is just a replacement for your um, what's built into your computer but over the years what's built into your computer has been morphing. It started off in the early days that you always had a line in and a, and a headphone out and then a microphone or something but nowadays you don't get all those interfaces so if we want to be able to send things in beyond the microphone, like from a wire, and I'm going to be doing that on my um, cell phone here because I've got my cell phone function generator on here that I'll be using as a test signal. We've got some extra cables up here and some extra dongles if you want to play with that. Um, so that's just an example of what that is. And then these lower blocks down here, this is where all the radio stuff is. So all the orange blocks involve radio communications, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, receive, and then uh, the guts of the cell phone from the original cell phone that just did uh, voice communications, but now it's digital communications, but transmit, receive, filters, power amplifier, and a switch and other such things. That's all signal processing and communication. So it's just filled up with all kinds of signals, uh, signal processing. Anybody have any comments on how, if you've never, has, have most of you thought about these things, but you, you don't lose sleep over it, right? <laughs> What's another signal processing application? Um, I drove from Colorado Springs to Denver International on Sunday and I used my cruise control. Um, so this is, this is another control system. Uh, or this is a control system and it has to take care of um, controlling the vehicle's velocity based on our set point. It has to be able to manage disturbances like wind and hills. When I was writing my book, I, I looked at the, the, uh, the study of you know, how wind impacts vehicle velocity. It's, that's more of a mechanical engineering thing. But, and then something else that you can add to this block diagram, because I have a new car, it has a radar sensor on it that engages automatically Toyota vehicle is what I have. And what does that do? That's another, what does that do though? It's designed to make sure if I'm falling too closely, it, it disengages or adjusts uh, my velocity so I don't rear end somebody. So that's another signal processing aspect of um, cruise controls. It's amazing, right? I, I got this new car because unfortunately I was in a bad accident um, with my family a block from my house when somebody ran a four-way stop. So it totaled the car. It didn't hurt any of us really badly. But um, So I bought a new car and it, I wanted to get safety features and it does make my insurance rates lower actually but I have all that standard stuff. <coughs> Okay, now getting into topics and some highlights. We're going to start off with an overview of continuous and discrete systems, signals and systems modeling. And that's 
not an essential ingredient to get to the fun stuff at the end, but because it's part of the package and I said it would be hands-on with the package, I want to at least show you a few bits and pieces of that. Then when we go into the system side of things, things we'll be emphasizing um, filter design. And then we'll get into some audio applications. We'll do some static processing, but we'll also we'll be using Pi Audio to play some things back. Um, we'll also use the audio widget that's part of the Jupyter Notebook, so you can just play a WAV file back, and we'll, we'll do quite a bit of that. Um, I was having a problem with that yesterday, and I had to switch to using Pi Audio to stream things. And then we'll move into communications theory, a little bit of that, and signal processing implementation of communications ideas so we can do analog modulation theory. It turns out I didn't put any of that in, but I have links to things of that sort. Digital modulation theory and simulation, we'll play around with that a bit in a notebook. And um, that will introduce some of the tools from the digital comm um, package. And then at the very end, we're going to play with the dongle. And just a little comment on the dongle, why is it so cheap? Well, it's, um, it's a repurposed digital TV tuner for areas of the world where um, TV is distributed um, by a distribution network that you just get um, where you have to have a dongle. So it allowed people I think it's in Europe mostly. Does anybody use a TV dongle here in the US? I don't, I mean. But they were designed to be inexpensive and because they're mass produced. So somebody came along with um, a hack that basically said we can use this as a radio that we can receive a lot of different signals. And if you, if you get excited about this and go cruising around, you'll find there's a lot of apps pre-built out there I had a graduate student did his master's project with me who kind of introduced me to the dongle and he wanted to track the tail numbers on aircraft because every aircraft transmit at about one gigahertz um, status information in flight and there's apps out there that you can play with and you can see all the aircraft flying around the country. Does that sound good or bad? Mm, it's, scary. it's scary actually to me but um, have you ever searched for a flight? Like you got some friends or family coming from, say, Washington, D.C., let's say, and they're coming to Denver. You can just put in UA, you know, United Airlines um, flight number on Google, and then eventually you can find a link that says, I want to track that flight, and you will see on a map the location of that flight. And that's this system. It's just open. Anybody can do that. So these dongles can pick up those signals and you can track that. How many sensors do you think is required? Um, I don't know. I, it, actually, when I see that, I think, who is running this network? Right. I don't, I don't know. Well, maybe individual people have. And they've put them, they've streamed them up there and then these services, that could be. Has anybody done that, though? Or wondered how you can get that? Okay. Yeah, so uh, they have a bunch of distributed ones. You know, you can run on a Raspberry Pi, and if you uh, upload the data to the service, they'll give you free access to it. Okay. I mean, you're here for a reason, I presume, unless you just said, I want to just sit in here and yeah, you know, use some time, have some time fly by. But there is just, you know, I guess. Um, Something you need to understand about me, I'm kind of a maker type person. Does everybody know when I say the maker community what I'm talking about? I go to the maker fair in Colorado Springs and I bring gadgets and some of these things are some of the toys that I've bought to play with to go to the maker fair because I started off doing this when I was young with electronics and radio so I just I've never gotten tired of doing it and um, it's strange, but some of us are like that. Some of us do our hobby is our work. My wife says, that's sick. It's kind of like, why would you want to do that? I'm still working. I'm not retired yet. She, she left her job at FedEx. She's a software person. Um, she didn't like her job, and she just had a buyout and had to leave. Um, 
I have too much fun doing what I'm doing. And I tell my students that if you're going to be an engineer, it's so much work to get there. You ought to have fun doing what you're doing. And if you don't have fun part of the day, at least, um, there's something not right about your job. You can think about that, you know. If you're bagging groceries, you know, maybe that's just you're not having too much fun at that, but you're getting paid to do it. But I think engineers, because we work so hard, engineers, programmers, developers, um, you want to have some um, fun in what you're doing at least part of the day. Okay, our first lab that we're going to do is going to be audio um, speech-based. We'll be slowing down and speeding up an audio record without changing the pitch. Um, so you'll see how that works in Python momentarily. Yeah. We're going to look at some basic waveform um, and signal synthesis using um, some of the functions that are in SIGSYS. We'll also look at the spectrum that those signals occupy and I'm going to describe what the spectrum is of a signal in simple terms. I'm a musician as well. I play bass trombone in a jazz band and in my church's brass ensemble. So signal processing and music are pretty tightly linked. So I actually like working with speech and audio signal processing besides radio stuff. We'll get into um, the system side of things with filter design. And the core of the filters we're going to be looking at are these linear constant coefficient difference equations, or LCCDE. Now, when I wrote the dummies book, because linear constant coefficient differential equation has the exact same letters, they made me put an additional appendage onto that. But we're only going to be looking at the difference equation version, no differential equation version. This is the general form of the difference equation that has both feed forward, as they're called, and feedback. So, I'm going to walk through this in a little bit more detail when we get to it in the, in the lecture, but that right there is the algorithm for doing filtering. So if you're not thinking as an electrical engineer, which I can't not do, basically, you can say, I want to know what an algorithm is to do something. This is the algorithm. That math right there describes the algorithm. If I was to try to make a non-electrical engineer build a circuit and get it to do the same thing in the electronic circuit world, it would be very foreign to you, but I think um, you can pick up an algorithm idea very quickly. I work in my consulting work with people that are just programmers and I have them learn about doing very signal processing things. They're always highly intimidated at the beginning and I just say, look, it's just this. Write some code that looks like this or instantiate your code on a floating, uh, I mean, field programmable gate array and once they get going, it's fine, but initially they're intimidated. I have to do signal processing. I don't have an EE background, and I've worked with a lot of people that come through that, and they're not experts, but they can get pretty good at what they're doing just by um, practicing at it. We'll consider the frequency response of these filters once we take them into their system function or frequency response form and we'll be working then with complex variables or com complex arithmetic. And then likewise, the key to working with um, difference equations in SciPy is, is the package signal within SciPy and then the function is L filter and L filter takes in an array, an ND array B and an ND array A and then it takes in an array of signal samples X and it returns an array of signal samples Y. This is the most utilized function in, in my modeling and simulating with Python would be signal.l filter. And the A and B arrays are exactly the coefficients that you see in the difference equation. There's a, there's a set of them, the A coefficients and the B coefficients. This is, and then we're going to drill down a bit on a few, a couple of types of filters, and then the, the filters that the package um, helpers design, FIR and IIR design helper. Just a quick example of how easy it is to design a, a filter, though, 
import the package, say, FIR design helper, and then suppose I want to do an equal ripple bandpass filter that uses the Remez exchange algorithm, and this is all built into the package. You just specify the cutoff frequencies and the pass band gain and the pass and the stop band gain or stop band attenuation. And then there's a supporting function that can plot and overlay filter responses. Now I'm going to have to explain what a filter is, but does anybody want to tell me what their vision, view of a filter is? Non electrical or not systems wise, but what is a filter? Just in a very simple way. Maybe if you drink coffee, what is a filter relative to making coffee? It removes the things that you don't want. Okay. So and you what you do want. Okay. Does everybody hear that? Removes what you don't want and leaves, leaves passing through what you do want, which is water that's, I'll just say brown colored. I mean, I don't drink coffee, so I can, to each one of you that means something different though. So that's exactly right, and so filters come in different forms, but when you look at the frequency spectrum, and that's what everything we do besides the waveform, which is what's really traveling through space on the wires, we view the content of the waveform from another point of view called the frequency domain, and that tells us spectrally what signals at what frequencies will pass. In this case, it's a bandpass filter, so it's going to pass signals that have a gain of 0 dB, which is like multiplying the signal by 1 at 0 dB, and then it has 60 dB of attenuation everywhere else. We'll hear that, we'll process that with Pi Audio, um, and it's called an equal ripple because there's an equal amount of ripple across the pass band, which is a good band we want to have, and then there's an equal amount of ripple across the stop band, and those are set by the attributes up there. Half a dB in the pass band of ripple and 60 dB down, or 60 dB of attenuation in the stop band. To me, it looks beautiful. To you, it might be like, what is that? Um, and this is how Pi Audio will do it when we get to it, um, talking about it in more detail later in today's session. We'll use an object that I've created um, in the Pi Audio Helper module, and it wraps up some of the details of using Pi Audio. And what it brings outside of Pi Audio then, this interface into your Jupyter Notebook, is just the need to write a callback function, which then processes the signal samples that are captured from the input to the audio device, whichever one you're going to talk to on your computer, and then sends the samples back out to the playback or audio output device on your PC. And I've got some other um, instrumentation that I'm setting up in here. You see callback tick and callback talk. Those are emulations of what an electrical engineer would do with a lot, something called the logic analyzer, which allows you to get the timing and see how much time you're spending in the callback. I'll get, come back to this later, but I'm just going to see if anybody's thinking how, what you're thinking when I say time spent in the callback. What, what does time spent in the callback mean to anybody who wants to just venture a guess? What's the significance of time spent in a callback? It, callbacks show up all over the place in Python. They were talked about at sessions yesterday for sure, but in the context of signal processing, what do you think time spent in a callback means to you as a developer? Anybody want to venture a guess right now? I could spend a lot of time or I could spend a little time. What do I want to do? S spend as little time as possible. Latency. Latency is an issue. And if I spend too much time in the callback, I'm going to miss the next batch of samples that are going to be thrown at me by the processor. And if I do that, then I can't maintain real time and then my audio stream is going to be all broken and chopped up. That, does that make sense? How many of you listen to audio streams on the internet while you're working? Just about everybody does, right? What happens when your connection's not good? Your stream is, gets choppy sounding, right? 
same idea here. Along with this part of the discussion, I'll also at least sideline how I use Python and connect it over to doing real-time processing in C and embedded systems. So I, I, I use Python on both sides of that to kind of be my um, platform for bringing things together. And, and some of the data sets that are on the repository are some examples of captures that I've made. I actually brought a piece of instrumentation with me. This is a oscilloscope and spectrum analyzer and signal generator in a box through a USB interface. And everything that I'm, I'll be showing you um, in the repository, I could set this up. And if we have time, I may set up my analog discovery too. Um, to me, this is great because I need to do a lot of things and I don't want to stay in the lab. I want to go home and work so I can just carry this thing home with me. and replaces a lot of instrumentation in the lab. It's kind of a maker's gadget, but it's also an um, engineering student's gadget, too. Some universities require students to buy one of those. And they cost, if you're a student at a university, they cost $180. If you're not at a university, they cost about $250. But if you're interested, you can ask me at the break or whenever is appropriate. We'll, we'll build some notch filters so we can excise interfering signals and we'll play with that a little bit in another um, lab experience. I wanted to do something with adaptive filters. I have that in SIG SIS, but I just um, dropped down on that one. We will look at flanging as an audio special effect and we'll have that come through Pi Audio. I could have done echo or reverb. Flanging is kind of an exciting one, and we'll use something that I have in the digital comm package or module, which implements a time, time varying time delay. So time varying time delay. Does that strike a chord in anybody's mind? Like, this sounds very strange. You know, I'm talking to you, and there's a time delay between me and your ears picking it up. So what happens if I make that delay time actually vary with time, like getting closer, further away? What does that make you think of? Anybody in here? Doppler, right? Because everybody in here has probably had some physics in your life, or you stand on the corner when an ambulance comes by and you experience the Doppler. So. It's exactly what it is, but you can make that anything, and I developed it originally for work I was doing on some um, consulting where I need to, need to model things in SATCOM, where satellites flying overhead on a um, non-geostationary -station, orbit, and you want to model effects like that. Actually, some of the work I did here ended up in a product at a company um, that sells channel, channel simulators for SATCOM. Um, but it, it's very similar to what you do in audio special effects, too. So we'll play with that. We'll also get exposed to um, something called complex frequency translation, which actually is what the dongle does for us. We can take the spectrum of a signal and move it to a new location, and that's just what this bullet says. Multiply a signal by a complex sinusoid, and now I'm assuming that You've had some, familiar, you know, some familiarity with um, Euler's formulas, but I'm not sure where you would have learned that. Calculus, I think. J is an electrical engineering version of I, square root of minus one. Talk about modulation, and then when we get into the dongle, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to play with receiver algorithms that will implement stereo a stereo FM demodulator from a, a captured waveform. And I have the captured waveforms in the repository, or the idea will be to actually receive them and process them um, from a, capture, a live capture. I don't have live streaming in the package yet because that requires more intense coding. You have to learn how to write real-time code and make this callback stuff work, so you have to do a asynchronous capture from the dongle and then the asynchronous playback through the callbacks and that's mating 
two different um, screening processes. And I assigned this to a graduate student to work on about two years ago, and he hasn't been working on his thesis at all or his project. He just kind of disappeared. Some of you have graduate degrees, some of you don't, but I have a lot of, a fair number of students that start a degree and just, they get going to work and then they never finish it. And this student left Colorado Springs and went to Washington. He works for Fluke Networks, which is a company that builds instruments and things. Well, it was Fluke, it changed, its, it changed names because it was bought by somebody, but. And then people get married, people start a family, a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Things just change, and the degree maybe doesn't mean what it once meant. At any rate, this is the dongle with the antenna. I've got it set up right here. And then the block diagram that we'll be implementing for the stereo will take the output of the dongle, do some filtering, downsample the signal, run it into a FM detection algorithm called the discriminator, do some more filtering. We'll look at how we get back left and right channels. We have a phase lock loop in here in order to do some modulation. I'm going to walk you through a lot of these things. There's a lot of nitty gritty stuff, and depending upon your interest, you can just say, oh, it's just something that does this. I'll take it for granted, or I'm really interested in it. But it's all in Python, so you can dissect it as you see fit. Another thing that we'll do is um, frequency shift keying. Some of you were here early and you heard me, heard some strange sounds over the speakers. I've actually got an FM stereo transmitter right here in hardware. Now, it'll make up for the fact that down below at this lower level, the FM radio stations are fairly weak, but I have my own radio station right here. And this is a little maker thing too. This is on a breadboard with a module from a company called Adafruit. And this breadboard has an Arduino microcontroller sitting inside of it. How many of you have ever heard of Arduino? So a lot of you know what I'm talking about then. So that's the basis for that. And that's just, um, I'm putting FSK out on that frequency shift keying. And originally, I wanted to have you demodulate and parse out a message. And I wasn't going to tell you what it was. but. Um, I wasn't able to store a long enough record on the Arduino, and I kind of backed down on that due to the memory size and some programming issues. And that's programmed in a C++ kind of environment, but at least it's running. And this is, a, this is something I just bought a couple of weeks ago for this because it's replacing things I do in my lab, and that's a lot less expensive and a lot easier for me to carry than um, what I would have ha had to do otherwise. So maybe that's intriguing to some of you um, because I built bootleg transmitters and things a long time ago when I was in college. Um, I'm amazed, you know, it's really easy to buy one of those now. Um, it's a chip on there made by Silicon Labs and a lot of these things are just part of what the industry is now demanded. You know, you can buy an FM wireless microphone and other such things. Um, so those are chips that were developed for, for industry and products that are out there, and once they become an ASIC, the price can come way down due to volume. So now we're ready to enter the first lab. Um, I'm supposed to be wary of the fact that 2.15 to 4 is snack time. So um, I'll introduce this lab, and then we can decide either to take the break um, before we start on it, or take a break and come back and start on it. But the first lab is is slow down playback um, and speed up um, the playback. And this is in a Jupyter notebook that I'm going to point you at. But let me just talk about what the basic idea is. You have a speech vector that has samples in it. And optionally, I'm going to play with Pi Audio so you can record your own using the microphone on your PC. It's more fun to do this with your own voice because you'll get to hear yourself talking fast or talking slow with the pitch not changing. Um, this thing keeps stopping on me. Or maybe the interface is having a problem. But I've got a sample, so you can do it either way. But if you take the Pi Audio route, you'll get a chance to start playing with Pi Audio earlier. So the stream comes in, samples in a vector. Um, 
I originally developed this for MATLAB, so sorry, the index there at the top is one and not zero. Um, I just realized that on my figure. It's a flaw. But samples come in, and what I want to do is use the reshape function, which is part of NumPy, and reshape this array. And what I'm going to do when I reshape it is I'm going to reshape it into segments. Maybe um, I've got this thing, I think, yeah, these figures got mixed up. The figures are flip-flopped. This is the first figure. This is the figure for the speed up. And then the slow down is the other one. So what does this say? Speed up. Never mind. Speed up is what I'm going to have you do first though, on the lab. So the pictures are in the wrong order. But speed up is to say the vector gets reorganized into subsegments. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to only keep every other subsegment. So I'm going to start skipping segments of the speech file so I can play it back faster. Does that make sense? I'll just say little snippets in between. I'm going to be cutting them out. And this method is called butt splicing. I'm not trying to sound crude or anything. It's, it harkens back to working with digital audio tape where people were actually cutting magnetic recording tape and then splicing it together. Does that, does it, can anybody relate to that unless you're really old? Nobody's ever played with tape before, right? But that's why it's called butt splicing, as in cutting and butting the two ends together and taping them. So you'll put out every other one, but then you have to reshape it. And I'm proposing that you use the ordering scheme from reshape called F as opposed to C. What does that mean? F is for Fortran. C is for C. So C is which organization in, a, in an array, if it's a an array of data, a 2D array. It's, there's row major and column major, right, in organization of data and st how stored. So C is row major and Fortran is column major, I believe. So is that still used at all? Has anybody ever heard that before? Or you don't care about it, probably, because you just say it's an array. I don't care how it's stored. But electrical engineers, when they're working with devices, think about how is it stored in memory. And if you have a 2D array, you can just make it a 1D array and properly index it using striding and things like that. Striding is probably something you've heard of before, though, right? And then the slow down idea is to take the same array and reshape it. And then we'll use dstack, is my preference from Python NumPy which is vertical stacking. So I'll take the array and then I'll just stack another one right on top of it. And then I'll reshape it back out again. So what I'll be doing is playing each little subsegment twice. I'm just going to have you speed up by a factor of two and slow down by a factor of two. These are some functions that are in that are taken as wrappers to scipy io .wav file read and write. In sig sys, they're just um, two wave and from wave. So what you want to open up now is, let's see where am I at? Yeah, it's called speech processing. What am I, yeah, that's the name of it. Speech processing .ipython notebook, which should be yeah, it's in. Yeah, we're going to take. The, we're going to be taking the break now, but it's in. Um, in the wrong thing, right here. Yeah, so tutorial part zero. So it's that guy right there, and if you want to use a built-in file, you can use this one, which is me, or these are some audio speech files that eight kilo samples. They're all at eight kilosamples per second. Or, like I said, we'll come back and I'll talk about using Pi Audio. So maybe I'm deciding for us. Do you want to take the break now or do you want to just keep pushing?
Say yes or no. Take a break. No? Keep pushing? Okay. Okay, we'll do it. Okay, as a lot of you are already back in here, let me just explain. Um, if you want to try to get Pi Audio going right now, what you want to do is just, you know, well, first let me explain my philosophy in, in using my notebooks is I just do cell by cell um, running. So I bring this guy up and I will run cell one. And I'm importing PyLab, which to me, I know a lot of you don't like doing, but it just pollutes my namespace up with everything so I don't have to put prefixes on things. It's just, for me, it's more convenient. And then I'm importing some packages that I, that I use. Um, then I have this second cell, just configures me to use um, SVG graphics, which are a lot sharper, so I like to use that by default, but I have it toggled. Toggleable, so you can use PNG or PDF. Words here. But then the first thing you can do when you are set to go is you can run this available devices. And this is telling you that Pi Audio is working, and it's also telling you what devices are on your system and how you're going to patch to them using the index 0, 1, and because I have my radio dongle plugged in, or there's, a, there's an HDMI cable on my computer, I'm getting this. This is the um, index for the HDMI cable for the display. And then this is an audio device that I have plugged in, which is my little 650 sound card that's plugged in there. So, if you're a developer and you want to talk to something, what do you need? You need to have your roadmap and how you're going to connect to the right devices on your system. So this to me is the first thing that I did when I wrote this module. I, I wanted to know what was out there because I wanted to know how to get the right connections. Does that make sense? If not, Pi Audio has a part of the interface which I didn't utilize which would automatically detect your the default devices, but my experience of working with audio on any computer is that the default devices are frequently not what I want, so I wanted to be able to have control of it. I'm kind of a fanatic about control, which I think a lot of you probably are too, because when you write software, control is kind of the whole deal. i got to be able to know what I'm doing. So for this first thing, though, you'll probably want to use the built-in microphone, and then you can select index one in my case for the output. So down below here, I've got a very simple callback which you won't have to change. But then down here, I'm creating an instance of this DSP IO stream object, and it's this parameter right here is the in index, and the next parameter is the out index. So I'm making that first one. In this case, I had it set to 2, but if I wanted to record off of my built-in microphone, I would set that to 0. And if I want to let it play back through the speakers, I would set it to 1, just because my interface requires something. So I'll set it to 1, but you're probably going to say, wait a minute, if I do that, my speakers are going to play back while I'm talking into my microphone, and that's going to be what? Feedback. But notice what I'm doing down here in my code. I'm multiplying the return audio by zero to make sure that nothing comes out of the speakers. And that's just done because of the way I wrote the interface. This Pi Audio helper thing I wrote, I, I have to admit it, I wrote it last week. I had I've been playing with it, but I hadn't really written it at all. I've been it's been on my mind and this graduate student never got into it, and I just said I don't know, I'm a crazy person like you probably are. Sometimes you, you don't actually do something until you're backed into a corner. So I signed up, the way I looked at it, I signed myself up to, to do this. So. so if I wanted to make a quick recording at this point, I would just, um, first of all, make sure this callback has been created. Um, and then I will create the object and I will record for five seconds. 
Hello, I'm here at SciPy doing a test recording, and I'm going to see um, what this turns out. Okay. I did five seconds worth, and now um, I've got a capture piece. Um, let me see. Yeah, wrong part. I'm taking DSPIO, the object that I just created, and the data capture is just an array that gets filled up as it's bringing samples on in. Those samples are as 16-bit signed integers. So in order to work with the wave format in my two-wave converter, I have to scale them back down again. So I'm just dividing by the maximum to get it within a range of plus minus one. And then I'm going to set up the speech control. So let's see if I got it. Hello, I'm here at SciPy doing a test recording, and I'm going to see, um... It ran out. Hello, I'm here at SciPy doing a test recording, and I'm going to see, um... There's latency involved here, so when it says it was done, it was actually just passing out the last few empty buffers, so I should have talked faster. And I guess I should be talking faster, because I'm going too slow. But you can do it that way, or if you'd rather do it this way, to do this exercise, speech.wave. If, if you like that one, go for that one. That was going to be what was going to come out over that transmitter down here, but I failed to get that up and running. So if you like that, that's what I'm going to be demoing in at the end of the exercise. That'll, my solution will be that little s slogan. So no pressure, you don't have to get Pi Audio working right now, and if it's too frustrating, just work with what I've already got in the repository. Because I want you to have fun, right? And if you were getting frustrated, that's not good. Yesterday, at, at the thing I went to on the widgets, I didn't follow the directions, and I totally corrupted my Anaconda root install, and I had to reinstall everything yesterday. I was not happy because I had to redo my Python install. So I learned my lesson. Don't be in a hurry. Don't get frustrated. But once, once I blew it away, I had to get it built back up so I could get it to run. So I've also got it set up um, to loop. That's another part of the interface here, so I can loop it. Um, so if I run this call back, I'm bringing in an object called loop, which just brings in my samples and creates this loop object. And now when it gets called back, it will automatically cycle it around in a loop. You could do that forever and forever, and you'd get really sick of hearing that same thing again. But that's just something so I could have it play at a longer period of time. Again, that's not relevant to the exercise, but just playing games. So now what I'd like, what you should be doing is trying to work this code through. And I put some hints in here to get you started. So you want to look at this, and then you want to think about this picture. So you look at the picture, you look at this. Sometimes when I'm trying to develop an algorithm, I will just create an array that has a sequence of numbers in it, and I'll try to see, especially if I'm reshaping, how I can organize it by just visualizing it. Does anybody else program that way? I want to visualize what's happening. So, And then I'm going to put the real data in after I, I mess with it. So I put in a sequence of numbers, 0 to 15, that it did a reshape. I did it with the C ordering. And I said, this picture doesn't look like this visual over here. doesn't look like this stack. I want to be able to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, so that I can use um, slicing to take every other column there. So then I switched it to the Fortran ordering, and then 
then I see what I want to see. I see 0, 1, 2, 3. And then I can just take this one, this one, and this one, and this one by slicing. Does that make sense? Does anybody have it working? I haven't heard it, I haven't heard it yet, but um, it's just a few lines of code. That's what it's going to be. OK. There's one little glitchy thing that you, you're going to have to go through, and that is you want to make sure the, um, the number of rows you stick in up here times the number of columns is going to be the length of the original array. But you've got to have things work out into integers. So if you want to have um, that work out properly, you're going to have to pick some integer length. This is going to be the length of your speech subsegment. And mine is around 100 to 400. And that's the area that I'm working in. And then you're going to have so many columns. And the product of those two numbers has to be um, the size of the input array. So if your input array is not divisible by those two, the product of those two integers, then you're going to have to do some trimming. So I would trim off the end. So you're going to be using some int types of things, you know, where you're going to make sure that it multiplies out to an integer. I don't know how else to say that, except you just have to tackle the problem to actually see what the issues are. This is a lab that students work on, and when I talk to talk them through it, you know, you just got to kind of confront it head on and say, oh, that's what he's talking about, or that's what the issue is. And then after you decimate it by taking every other column, you have to make sure when you reshape it back into a linear array at the end, it will um, take that into account. And then the very, very last step is you have to think that when you reshape at the very end back to a linear array, it's going to be a two-dimensional ND array but you want to actually flatten it back down to a 1D array. So that's a method called dot flatten parentheses. Has anybody ever used flatten before? Because that's the way the wave playback tool wants to see it as a 1D array. I'm, I'm testing you right now. This will get, help me decide what to do next. But you know, we'll only, we'll only spend a few more minutes, and then I'll um, show you my solution. Because the fun part is listening to it. And for me, it's listening to my voice fast and slow. It's like, I don't sound like that. So, so I'm, I'm kidding. Yes, I'm kidding. OK, here's, here's what I'm going to paste into the notebook. So the, the upper code block is the speed up, and the lower one is the slow down. So there's not necessarily any keyboard or display in the laser lab. There's that. But also, Okay, I'll just briefly walk through what I put in here. I've got I first find out the length of the speech tracker because I don't know if it's an odd or even number, if it's divisible by some integers, right? I've got to make sure that that works out properly. Or divisible by an integer to get another integer. So, and then I set the length of the sub. Um, um, sub. Uh, the clip, so I'm setting the length here and the number of rows I'm going to use. And I did that by experimentation, what sounded the best. I know I'm at, at eight kilosamples per second, and a speech phoneme is, that's the way we speak as humans, is around 10 milliseconds or less. That's an, an utterance or a syllable in speech. Has anybody been a speech processing person ever? Definitely big right now, speech processing is. So I, I set that at um, 400 for the speed up. And then I find out 
what the trend length needs to be on this by dividing nx by n sub, and then I take the integer part of that, and then I want to, um, the trend length of nx so that I can divide by the integer n sub is going to be this guy right here. And that's spurious. I don't know why that's sitting in there. And then I go ahead and do the reshape. So I have rows n sub and then nxt divided by n sub. And this could be done different ways if it's Python 3 or Python 2, 7. But I just used int instead to take care of both cases. And this shapes it like the picture showed. And then I'm going to take all the rows and I'm going to take all the columns, but I'm going to stride by a factor of 2. So I'll take every other column. And now I have to reshape it. And when I reshape it, I want to have a one by something. And that one by something is going to be, from the shape command, the number of columns times the number of rows that I have after I've done the striding across the columns. And then put it back together with the same Fortran ordering. And then I flatten it when I run it into the two-way function take it back to a 1D array. So let's run that. That's not me. I don't talk that fast. But the pitch has not changed, right? I mean, because when I said up here that we could, without changing the pitch, yeah, if I, wanted, if I wanted to play that game, I could have gone back up here. And what could I do up here? Um, I could bring this in as the vector, and then I could write it back out again with the sampling rate doubled up to 16 um, kilosamples per second. And then I'm gonna, my pitch is going to double. And that's, that was a constraint I said wouldn't work. I heard a few people playing that, right? You played it back faster, and then the pitch goes up. Yeah. That's what you did, right? Yeah. The Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck sound or something. Chipmunks, I guess, for my generation. OK, taking it the other way and stacking it, doing the V stack, which is what I did here. Um, I start off the same way, but then I put the V stack in just stack one on top of the other, and then I reshape the whole thing again, just like before. So this will lengthen it by a factor of two. Side pi 2017, to no radio. OK. You're not impressed, probably. My understanding is for people that have speech impediments or hearing disorders that slowing speech down could be useful for their understanding. Likewise, if people are talking too, too slow, they want to speed them up. So I got an email when I was flying over here on Sunday from Texas Instruments. Voice as the new user interface, a new era in speech processing. So this is just TI saying, Look, we're going to do a lot more speech processing and software and things. And some of you maybe are dealing with that already. So they're looking at that from the DSP processing standpoint. But I'm not going to dwell on that. I just am amazed at things I get in my email. It's like, hey, this kind of relates to something that I'm doing. OK, I'm going to move on now to part one. Is everybody good to go on? So I'm going to have to, um, well, I'm not going to rely on this. What I have to do is not be in there. Take this over to notes part one. And I'm going to need this notebook. OK, 
Okay, now we're going to do a little bit of <clears throat> signals and systems modeling and some simulation. And I'm going to, um, it's already 3 o'clock. I'm going to have to go a lot faster. I'm, I'm going to skip some stuff. But the first thing is basic signals. What are signals? Um, I think we kind of have an idea. can be um, a physically created signal, I mean a naturally created signal like a beating heart, wind, velocity being measured, and any other bio signal or naturally created thing can be a signal. But a lot of things that signal processing people deal with are also man-made signals because we're doing communications with them. We might purposefully be sending a ranging code up to a satellite so that we can receive it. As it turns around and we receive it, we can measure the Doppler off of it to get the velocity of that object. And we can also get the round trip delay time to get the range of that object. So that's a non-communications object, um, objective. But a lot of applications are just all oriented around communications processing. So the device that receives natural and man-made signals and gets it to the digital domain would be the digital to analog converter. Um, I guess I got to go up here and change this back to scroll. So what's a basic signal? It's a cosine wave. Cosine as a function of time is in electrical engineering terms is is the starting point for a signal. And a signal, like a cosine wave, has a defined period. It has an amplitude, and then it has a phase, or time shift relative to the time axes, which would be the phase of that cosine wave. Equation one is the continuous time, and equation two is the discrete time, which is what we see on the computer. As we increase the frequency of a continuous time wave, the oscillation rate goes faster and faster. But if we create the discrete time cosine wave, as this picture here is showing, if I increase the frequency, which is 2 pi times its frequency in the analog domain, what we would hear, divided by the sampling rate, the number of samples we take per second, you notice this interesting behavior that we start off at 0, we get a constant sequence. We increase that frequency and we get a sinusoid. We increase it still higher and we start seeing, get to a critical frequency where we're getting a sample that's high and a sample that's low alternating. And then um, as we increase still higher, we will see that the output frequency again starts getting smaller. And finally, when it gets up, to the sampling frequency as the frequency we're putting in. F naught is the same as Fs. We're back to a constant again. So I've just got this picture up here just to demonstrate what's, what's known as aliasing and one of the artifacts associated with sampling theory that if you sample too fast, you will lose information about the signal. And this is just demonstrating it was a convenient figure to grab that's in the book to talk about aliasing. And so this thing just states it in words. Uh, in order to manage aliasing, we need to sample our sampling rate to be greater than, it should say greater than twice the highest frequency. I don't know why I didn't put that in there. It was in my head. Greater than two times the highest frequency. This is a depiction on a folded sheet of paper that tells us how aliasing can be um, viewed as frequencies of the sinusoid. So the principal alias range is zero up to half the sampling rate. As I go from the sampling rate, it's like 8,000 samples per second is what we were just playing with in the audio clips. As I go from the folding frequency or half the sampling rate of 4,000 up to 8,000, all of these frequencies alias across on this red line and are audible down at this principal alias range from zero to fs over two. Likewise, you fold the sheet back again and go alias at all these other zones, as they're called in sampling theory. Most of the time, we don't think about that. But when we're doing signal processing, like in the radio at the end, we have to 
be cognizant of that to a certain extent. Actually, we have to be very cognizant of it, but I'm going to try to protect you. And actually, aliasing is like, to avoid aliasing, you just put filters in accordingly, and the filters protect your system from allowing signals in that would be confused. I guess you have to go back to the dictionary, as always, what I always think about is, what is the definition of alias? I'll let you think about that, but it's, you know, it's your, it's somebody who's not who you think it is. It's an alias. And of course, in programming, aliases are used a lot. Um, an app that does con convert discrete time sinusoids to continuous time through the digital analog converter is, you know, what I've talked about and I have in my cell phone. And we'll be using that a little bit later. Actually, I just turned it on. We'll be using a noise signal as our test vector <coughs> later on with Pi Audio. So a very simple type of signal that's used to understand how to formulate waveforms and signal processing are pulse type signals. We have the sinusoid we just looked at, which runs for all time or for a long period of time, and then we have pulse signals that are used in communications, digital communications, radar, and other things. I mean, a digital communications waveform is just a con continuous stream of pulses is the way to think of it. And these are primitives <clears throat> which are available inside of SIGSYS. So I have this traditional rectangle pulse, which is, um, I don't have it listed here, but we're going to see it in a second. And then I have the triangle pulse. And then some other pulses that are used in digital comms are a raised cosine and a square root raised cosine. Before we go on any further, we're going to jump over and just ponder the frequency domain for a second. I'm going to keep this really simple, but when I've talked about the spectral domain, it's just turning things 90 degrees, kind of like. If we look at a single sinusoid, it will have a period, and one over the period is the frequency of that sinusoid. So the blue and the green are two different sinusoids. I add them together and I get the red. I can't really tell what I've got there anymore. I know I've got two signals, but it's all squiggly. I can't see it distinctly as that's one signal and that's another. But if I go to the spectral domain and I look at the attributes of the red signal, I know that it's composed of two different amplitudes originally, A1 and A2. And along the, the horizontal axis is the frequency now. So I'm just portraying the information differently. And this is what the Fourier transform obtains by looking at that composite signal, or the fast Fourier transform gets that information with some nuances. But, but just keeping it simple, that's what goes on. So does that make sense? That's why I was talking about music earlier. If you play music and you think about harmonic structure and an ensemble playing in tune, you're thinking about all of these harmonics from our instruments having to blend together harmonically if we want to create nice sounding music. Formally, you know, the Fourier transform is this equation four, which involves this integral. But I have a function in this next notebook called Fourier transform approximation, which uses the epithet. Before we get to the notebook, a little bit on systems now. So what is a system? Because the name of my book is Signals and Systems for Dummies. We have signals. We create signals, or we have our natural signals. A system operates on a signal. And do we need to have systems operating on signals? Yes, because that's how we're going to manipulate things to um, get information from point A to point B. So a good example of why we'd need a system is the signal that's arriving is noisy. And a lot of the noise that's on that signal on the left is not really in a frequency band now that's of interest to us. So we put a filter in this system so it cleans up that signal. We want to build filters that are called um, causal or non-anticipatory. And the definition of causality is right up here, a signal that depends only on present and past inputs. 
And I say we want that because can we do anything but that? Um, can we predict the future? Some of you that are in the money markets and things say, I'm going to build an algorithm that's going to try to predict the future, but we really can't. We only can estimate it. Question? What's an example of something that would be a present or past kind of a dependent filter? The future. But I mean, like, practically, with like, like, how would you build a filter? Like, what would you be taking into account for, like, if you did that? The future. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm saying that is because we don't know the future. So we, mathematically, I mean, if you're, if you think about mathematics, and you probably try not to think too deeply about mathematics, except when you're in college, um, it's very deep, right? You can you can put anything on paper with mathematics. Can you build those things? No. So mathematics would allow for a, a non-causal filter. So I'm just stating that fact that we're only going to be talking about causal filters or ones that can be built. But the mathematics allows for anything. I probably should have left that out. I'm a person that likes to poke people's brains, so I'm, it's, you, asked, you asked a very fair question. No, I'm not picking on you at all. Are you OK? Yeah. OK. Does it bring back memories or something? Because I don't know what your background is. You bumped into causality. I mean, physicists talk about causa causality as well. And I think Albert Einstein talked about causality and relativity theory, if I'm thinking back right. I'm not, we're not going to debate that, though. Somebody in here will probably love to talk, stand up and talk. So here's the difference equation back again. Um, we can build causal systems with this difference equation set up. And the difference equation set up if we think about the signal flow, and the signal flow actually works together with that equation 5 and allows us to visualize how the signal from the input gets to the output. So the equation is the mathematics, but this flow diagram is how I visualize what the algorithm is doing. The signal enters here as a sample. One copy of it shows up at the output. Another copy goes through this path, and that z to the minus 1 means I delay by one sample. And I'm just manipulating data in an array. Whether you're signal processing or not, you can get the idea that the value at this index, I can just grab, have a value that was stored away previously. So I've got a history there. And that's what the z to the minus ones mean. So that flow diagram is implementing what's up above. But if you're um, just thinking in terms of programming terms, the diagram up above is the most sensible. It just says the present output y is equal to the present input weighted by v0, one input in the past weighted by v1, and so on, and then minus a scaled weighting of the past outputs. So these would be called feed forward, we're feeding forward copies of the present and past input, and we're feeding back copies of the past output. Totally causal. We have all of that data available to us at the present time to do that filtering operation. Sound reasonable? And if you're a statistician, you're also thinking, when I do that, what am I doing from a statistical standpoint? There's a word that starts with C. I'm creating correlation between um, the signal and itself at different time lags because I'm now putting that dependency in. But filtering needs that. You need to do things like a moving average or something to smooth the data. This is just another structure. This is more along the lines of what NumPy's L filter, I mean, scipy.signal.l filter uses an algorithm that looks more like this. It's called the direct form 2 and then you transpose it. But how we view the design of filters is by taking the difference equation and taking an operation called the z-transform on both sides of the difference equation. And then that allows us to abstract into the z-domain. And it's a joke amongst electrical engineers that when you enter the z-domain, you do what? Sleep. You know, people might in cartoons, Z's coming out of somebody's mouth means that they're sleeping. So 
I don't, I don't want you to fall asleep though. So we go into the Z domain and we have this ratio of polynomials in the Z domain. And this ratio of polynomials, it just simply rearranged things. The same coefficients are present, but now we have polynomials and those polynomials are useful in understanding how the filter works as well. And there's functions for displaying that information in SIGSYS as well. This is the definition of the Z transform down here with Z being a complex variable. When we go to higher order filters, um, say got a misspelling up here. That's supposed to say sci pi. At the, I think it was typed in the wrong order. Spicy came out somehow or another. Um, sometimes you don't want to do it as one big polynomial in the numerator and denominator. You want to go to a ratio of second order polynomials and then products of those. And scipy.signal supports that. It's called cascade of biquadratic sections, quadratic numerator and denominator, and then a product of those. So that's something that scipy.signal added, I think, about six months ago. And I've now integrated that into my package, and I, I use that for higher precision filtering. And then you implement a filter as a cascade because the mathematics in the Z domain says that I can just cascade these um, second order filters and I can get the effect of the big filter. And that's done in scipy.signal. And like I said, it's harnessed here and I run that in Pi Audio as well. It doesn't run faster, but it gives you more robustness to coefficient quantization issues and numerical precision is always something that can be a concern with um, signal processing. You're probably thinking, but I have double precision available. Isn't that good enough? And, but believe it or not, that's not always good enough. So a simple filter example, it's very popular in signal processing, is what's called a one-pole averaging filter. And the difference equation for that is this bank interest example that I talked about in part zero where the present output is the present input weighted by 1 minus alpha and, and alpha times the past value of the output. And alpha is called the forgetting factor in the use of this filter. It's very popular in implementations because it's a very simple piece of code to write. Um, the forgetting factor idea is that I'm going to forget the past by that factor alpha and I'm going to remember the present by the factor of 1 minus alpha. So I keep things in proportion, but I can set that alpha to different values. And that alpha is directly related to a circuit called an RC low pass filter, which a few of you might know what I'm talking about when I say an RC low pass filter. And it's the relationship is alpha is e to the minus t, the sample spacing, which is 1 over the sampling rate, or just e to the minus 1 over Fs times Rc. And then this can be related to a bandwidth of the filter. And I just brought that up as a little example to bring some physical reality to things. If we want to design more sophisticated filters, what I have in the toolbox of um, filter design that's built upon scipy.signal is FIR filters. This pretty much I wrote from scratch because it wasn't as much of this supported in SciPy, but there's other things out there that other people have written, but I just did something on my own because I wanted to know what I was doing. So we have a filter that can be a, a low-pass filter, which we utilize, a band-pass filter. On occasions, you want a stop-band filter where you uh, have a band of frequencies you reject, or you want a high-pass filter. And those are in there. And these are the interfaces to those functions. Right now, the package doesn't have documentation put together. I had a graduate or a, another senior student in computer science that was supposed to get um, the Sphinx documentation done for me, and he dropped the ball on me. But I, I let him hang out there because I had plenty to do. But we're going to get that done eventually. Some of the documentation is available, but it's not housed on the repository right now. Then the IIR filters, which have the feed forward and feedbacks running together. This is just the four amplitude response prototypes that can be built for those. 
and these are the interfaces and then some supporting functions. This um, cascade idea is sits on top of what scipy.signal added. So that's, like I said, that's a pretty new thing that they've just added to that package. So I'm, I'm utilizing that as well. And then there's the C headers function. So now um, it's time to go look at the next notebook. And this notebook is called Signals and Systems, and it's under part one. So I'm going to just start working my way down into it. And this function called Fourier Transform Approximation is, is um, it's in this notebook. It's not in any module right now, so you have to run that one. And so this is just a picture of some waveforms. And the idea with this is I'm going to have you try to synthesize a couple of these waveforms and you're going to follow my example. One of the things you have to do to synthesize a simple pulse waveform is go back to mathematics and function theory and suppose you have a function of time, capital lambda of t, and I want to move it to the right. I will change the argument t to be t minus t naught. And if t naught is greater than 0, I shift the function to the right. If t naught is less than 0, I shift the function to the left. Remember that from math? You can move functions around the axes. So as an example, I'm going to take this waveform, waveform number 5, and I'm going to synthesize that one. So I'm going to set up a time axis using the A range command, and then I'm going to tap into um, SS try and yeah, the, um, these are all the functions that are inside of um, SIG-SYS. And I'm going to use try to create a triangle pulse. It's, and it has the independent variable t, and then it has tau as its second argument. So it's synthesizing, um, well, it's not here, it's over here myself confused. Where was that? I'm trying to remember whether it was in the notebook. I thought it was right here. By quads, pulses. No, it was before system, so it's way up here. Yeah. This is the tri function, and then the rectangular pulse shape functions here. So if I want to synthesize something like this, I use dot tri. If I want to synthesize the rectangle, I use dot rect. And it takes t and tau, both of them. So those are the definitions. So over in here, I'm going to synthesize this waveform number 5, the one right in here. So I need to generate two triangles. I'm going to have a triangle that um, is offset to be centered on one, and then another triangle that's going to be offset in the opposite direction, centered on minus one, and the full base width of each of those triangles is two. So if I go back and look at the definition, the full base width on the triangle is defined to be minus tau to plus tau. So in other words, it's twice what its argument is. And these are textbook definitions, so that's why I've written the function that way. So down here in the code, I create a tau that has parameter. I use a try that has a parameter 1, so I get a full base width of 2, shift it off to the right by 1, and then I subtract from it a try that shifted to the left. This interface is not working very well. I'm doing nothing, and it's immediately going quiet. So those two things, synthesize it, and there it is, right there. And I could do further analysis on it. I might want to look at its spectral approximation. So I'll just feed that into my Fourier um, transform approximation. 
and I'll look at the spectral information or content of that waveform and see it centered around zero. So what I want you to do is um, try synthesizing this pulse right here in the notebook or, or pick something else that's in that table. So just pick this one. This one shows up in my transmitter over here. I'm using a biphase pulse shape to transmit FSK out of my Arduino transmitter here. And if you generate the spectrum of this after you generate the pulse shape, then I can explain a little bit about what the significance of um, biphase is. Yeah. This should be pretty quick. Um, you're just going to mimic what I've done up above here with the rect or with the tries and you're going to want to either put up two recs but here you have to interpret the math definition of this or if you don't want to do that just pick um, pick another one of these. This one is very similar to the one I did or this one is also very similar. It uses the rectangle pulse rather than the triangle pulse. And if I was you, I'd just make a copy of my cell and just put in a single pulse and get the get your feet on the ground with a single pulse and see if you can mimic, say, this one right here. Oh, this thing is very flaky. I probably have touched all this junk on the floor a few times that I place I shouldn't have. But I'd create a single rect and then just show that you can move it back and forth and then superimpose a second one and then go on to compute the spectrum of it just to see what the spectrum Pardon me? Um, what do I have coming up after this example wise? There's a lot of things in here that I can skip over. Yeah, there's not really a whole lot. This notebook actually ended up going to the next notebook which is in part two. So this is, this is the end of part one when I get done here. I'd like to get this through before we take a break. I want to do the notch filters though for sure. Before I leave this. So just do one of these and then I don't have the stickies to say when you're done but I don't want to get all wrapped up. This is more of an academic problem, but I put it in here because it's just showing you that SIG-SYS has got some fundamental things in it for building up waveforms. And even though none of you are probably in college studying core basics anymore, if I'm doing modeling and simulation in my consulting work, a lot of times I'll use these primitives to build up a little test case before I put something up into a bigger system because I'm just trying to build a quickie little prototype of something and then I build upon this and these primitives are useful. I think we all understand the concept of primitives are part of um, our building blocks that we use to build bigger things. So these are what I call primitives. And when I was in school, I had to draw this out on paper and I had to visualize things moving around and what I like about computer tools is you can just let the computer do all that lifting for you and see the picture very quickly. And then, you know, the spectrum tool lets you get the spectrum without having to wade through the pages of math to do the Fourier transform, which if you were students of mine, you'd be doing the math but then you'd be doing it numerically in Python and then you'd say, oh, if I plot my theoretical expression against my numerically calculated expression, they do compare. And I now I'm confident that I know something about pencil and paper analysis. I don't have the answers to this one typed out. I can probably just hack away at something, but I'm mostly interested in somebody just saying they've synthesized one of them. And maybe we'll... Six. 
You've got six. And why did I write these things anyway? Because when I wrote my book, all the figures were drawn using uh, matplotlib. So I decided to just create a function and my editors for the books, when I said I was writing software for the book, which they didn't really care about, they were like, what is that? I said, well, I spent the whole weekend writing, er, learning about Sphinx and creating documentation. What was that? My editor didn't know anything about software, but I said, well, now I have documentation for my functions. And then they didn't even care about any of that at all. In the end, I mean, they said, okay, you want to host your own software, it's your job. So that's why I'm, I'm able to create this package and put it out there because it, it was written for the book, but it's mine. And all the figures were written for the book and they're mine. I didn't sell the rights to them, to the publisher, which I didn't realize at the time. Um, but I'm glad because that way I don't have to worry about anything. It's my stuff, so. So let's move on. Um, so again, I have the points here on the biphase pulse, and this has been around for a long time. When I first worked in industry at, for an aerospace company down in Scottsdale, Arizona, they were doing biphase on satellite communications, and for the reasons, some of the reasons that I have identified here. If you have a long string of zeros or ones, you will always get a transition at every bit and you can synchronize to that properly because you don't have a problem with synchronization. Square root raise cosine, um, this is just a pulse that's popular in communications. Like LTE, for example, uses square root raise cosine and then you put another square root raise cosine at the end of the system and together it becomes a raised cosine, but the idea of the raised cosine is, you can see in the blue pulse, it's gonna pass through zero at multiples of the bit period. And that means one bit doesn't interfere with an adjacent bit, but um, I'm gonna use the scikit DSPCOM IR design helper in order to get this overlay function called frequency response list and I'm going to contort the use of this to get the spectrum um, of a discrete time pulse. So here I'm just computing the spectrum of the raised cosine and square root raised cosine and what I'm after here is to just see that the spectrum is very compact. Um, it cuts off and just drops very rapidly, whereas the pulses we were looking at earlier, like some of you showed me, have a lot of bumps that are at a fairly high level that don't disappear fast enough. And in modern digital communications, we don't, that's not the, the right thing to do. You want to be able to put signals close to each other and not have them interfere with, with each other. So raise cosine, square root raise cosine drop off fairly rapidly and allow you to pack more signals on a given band of frequencies. And you know spectral efficiency is something that we're, we're striving for in the United States and everywhere in the world for that matter because something about spectral occupancy <clears throat> is what? We have only so much coal, we have only so much gas, we have only so much bandwidth spectrum, right? So it's a natural resource and we have to use it wisely. Can you scroll that back up to the code on that, please? Yeah. I've got an error uh, raised cosine square. Okay. Scroll up the N, scroll up one more bit. Yeah, yeah you just need Word. it to define. What is N? The N isn't defined in ours? No, ours is missing that line that says N equals A range. Yeah, I might have added that later. Oh, okay. That's right. Okay. Now this is my first time doing a tutorial like this where I had to build, push, or commit, push. I've never quite done it like this before and I got into cycles where I had to, you know, fix something and then commit and re-push and something slipped through the crack. Some of you are really good at this stuff. I'm not a Git fanatic. I, I like it a lot now, but I haven't been using it for that many years. Okay, let's um, skip over this aliasing. I'll just mention that there is a neat little function that gets us the principal alias. Um, so you can put in the sampling rate and you can put in the frequency and it will return 
the signal as it aliases down. Remember that diagram with the folded sheet on it, so it'll return the principal alias. And in software defined radio, um, we purposefully undersample a signal in order to translate it down in frequency and then bring it into a receiver. So this is a special use case of sampling theory. Um, where you can undersample a signal, purposefully introduce aliasing, but it's controlled aliasing, which is a pretty neat thing. Now, for those of you in data science, would you purposefully decimate your data knowing that you were going to cause harm to your results? I would say no, right, because that, that could be dangerous. But um, in signal processing, we, if we do it carefully, we can get away with it. So. So notch filter to remove interference. Um, in this example here, I'm using um, an audio test vector. I'm putting up a couple of sinusoids, one at 1,000 hertz and one at 1,500 hertz. And I'm combining that with the speech vector. So I'm calling this SNOI, SNOI is the spelling of that signal not of interest, it's kind of a military term, and signal of interest is SOI, S-O-I. So I sum those two together, and that's the spectrum of the signal. So the speech has got kind of a wide band spectrum. It's a guy talking, and then these two spikes here are the sinusoidal spectral spikes that we saw earlier in that drawing that I had at 1,000 and 1,500. So let's see, I might not have this back in the right order. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't finish this. So this we can finish together. How would that be? Um, so I've got to do an SSD to wave and I've got to put in a proposed file name. So this is going to be my input. So the, um, rn.wave, and my function call says I have to put in the rate. That's going to be 8,000. Or actually, I have it up above, but I'm going to put in the signal I generated here is r. And so I'm, I'm really just using Python. I could be using PyAudio, but this is too much, too convenient. I'm just going to use the audio tool in the Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to play it back immediately. So I'm going to store it away, and then I'm going to call it back in. So I haven't created it yet, so I can't use tab completion. I've got to do a little bit of scaling on that. It's overloading, so I'm going to divide that by four and just see if that's a little bit better. I'm overloading the um, interface to the audio. Okay, the tones are just kind of omnipresent, right? There's two of them, 1,000 and 1,500. So I've got a little tool for designing um, kind of precision notch filters. And this tool right here is in SIGSYS. And it lets me put in the frequency where I'm going to try to reject something. This is that coffee filter idea right at that frequency and then the sampling rate. And then I get to control um, the sharpness of the notch in terms of the location of a pole. And I'll talk about that in just a second here at 0.95. So I'm putting up two of those notches, one at 1,000 and my other interfering tone was at 1,500. I'll make that notch a little bit tighter, and then I have a function that will allow me to cascade those two filters together. So I'll have one filter notching out 1,000, another one at 1,500. And what I'm going to do here is look at the plot of that composite. So there's my two notch filters, and this is kind of a bad looking plot because I've, I shouldn't be going down to minus 250 dB. That's um, just not practical. So it'd be, a, it'd be a smarter thing in the code here to just put in a, a wide limb to limit and maybe go minus 100. 
to 10 or something like that. There. So that's like a nail going into a coffin or something. I'm not going to let that signal pass through. If I was to put in a parameter like 0.8 and, for example, now you see that the notch is getting broader and it's still going down to zero. It's just I'm not sampling at a high enough rate. Give me color for the first one. What's that? First filter. Um, for the... Oh, yeah. That's why I didn't change enough. There we go. That looks more like what I was thinking. So let me call up in another function to visualize. Remember, I talked about poles and zeros. So I can go SS Z plane. And I can go ahead and take my filter coefficients in the difference equation, the AN and the BN. So this guy just says put in the BN coefficients and the AN coefficients and some other optional arguments for scaling and rooting polynomials and so on. Um, this should be in scipy.signal, but I made my own four years ago because for me, seeing the poles and the zeros, poles tell me where, well, I haven't really talked about pole and zero plots, but um, if you like camping, what's something that you have that you, when you put up your tent? You have poles and you also have stakes. So a pole is where a function in the complex Z plane, think of the Z plane as a rubbery surface in the complex plane, real and imaginary part. I put a pole in and that's where the surface goes to infinity. I put a stake in or a tack in and I'm tacking that surface to zero. So when we're looking at the frequency response, we're scanning around here on the unit circle and when I get at an angle, that corresponds to a frequency now in the complex plane. It's the angle it makes to the real axes. I'm going to be tacked down to zero and that is the null in my notch filter. And then this pole is sitting up here on a radial. It's trying to go off to infinity. And what the pole does by going up to infinity at this point, it's trying to fight against this zero. And those two things in combination are creating that very sharp spike. So it comes over and then drives down. If I have a pole further back, this doesn't have as much influence. But when I have it really tight, then it makes that really sharp notch. Now, the downside is if the pole comes up and touches the unit circle, then my system is not stable. It would be like um, making a lot of money in the difference equation model where you'd get 100% return on your investment. You can't build a system like that because it will be unstable. So. That's kind of the story behind the pole zero plot. And that tool is in here. Um, it's kind of a support function because it's an added help. So let's just demo that, put this back to point 0.9, rerun this. Um, if I rerun this cell, you see the pole moves in closer. And now what I have to do is I can plot the waveform in the time domain, but I'll just skip that. I'm going to do um, process this through the filter. And then what I have to do now is go snag this, move it down here, drop it um, underneath here. So let's, the output of that filter was Z. So let's call it Z over 4. And I'm going to call it R out, or I should call it Z out. And I could play a longer segment of that, but that's what I chose. I think after I did that, it's probably better to put that back up to a gain of two because the tone was so powerful, it was drowning out the um, speech. Paint the sockets in the wall dull green. Now that's nice and cleaned up. I knew exactly where the interferers were. And you can see in the spectrum right here, these notches here and here are where it's, no here and here where it's generating it. Let me just run this again. But the idea of having the very sharp notch is I'm not taking much 
other information out of my speech. I'm just getting to the to remove um, the interfering tone. Now picture yourself in a military scenario where you've got a jammer out there. If you can excise this jammer, then um, you can still communicate. It's not far-fetched. It's reality. So I mean, we we do things to mitigate jammers, and that's one technique. But you have to have an adaptive notch because the jammer can move around. But what's in another e example of adaptivity? Um, Bluetooth uses adaptive frequency hopping. So Bluetooth devices can be side by side, but they hop around and they don't land at the same frequency th that often. That they cause a lot of data. Um, throughput issues. Well, so ends this. We're ready to move on. Um, anybody have any questions or did you have some success in following along or you want me to leave something up for a second before we take the next little break? Are you going to post this? Is this one? Because I don't think we have these. That doesn't, that's that's the yeah, I will take this, which is in my reference file, and then I'll move it to the GitHub repo, local repo, and then I'll push that back up when I get done. I also owe one more um, document. It's called the advanced part. And what I was going to do there was just going to throw a bunch of links into a markdown page that link to various things on my website. You haven't, we haven't been over here yet, but um, if we, if we, um, if you were to, to get into my info center, as I call it, um, there's tons of stuff on here. There's video lectures and lecture notes and assignments, Jupyter notebooks and everything. The stuff I'm doing right now um, came out of, well, it came out of this class, but this class I haven't got to teach it with Python because I just don't teach it anymore. I teach other classes. So it was taught with MATLAB originally. It's still taught with MATLAB. I'm trying to arm wrestle some professors into switching to Python, but I'm not having much success. This is why this package is here, though, to try to promote it that way. I have this mindset, but I'm taking on the world, right? MATLAB's very pervasive in, amongst my um, peers. It's like it's got a stronghold on it, but I think it's eventually going to back off. Take a break, though, and we'll, I'll, I'm going to reconfigure my stuff, and then we'll be able to, to go on and uh, to the next part. So we're going to do a lot more Pi audio, and then we'll move to the receivers. And I may even cut part of the Pi audio short, but mostly um, it's demoing Pi audio in a few experiments. Only part of it. Um, if we'll just go into here, and I'll show you what I've got up here. If I go to the, um, if I go into this page. Um, oh wait a minute! I didn't want to do that. It's the wrong one. Never mind. That's the dummies. This is on my website. If I go into here, the original module was called SSD, Signals and Systems for Dummies, but it came becomes now SIGSYS. And if I go into here, um, this is some of the documentation for that particular module. We don't have any other Sphinx documentation up for, like, if I go look in here, I go under, we were looking at um, try, right? That was one we were playing with a minute ago. So that one, that one is in here. So there's the example for that. But a lot of the examples are right there in the function in the um, doc string area, each function. Uh, so I thought, uh, so you say that you, it, you're asking somebody to help you with the documentation. Yeah, for the whole package. It's more than one module. Original, it was, originally, it was only this one module, but now it's all these modules. So How many modules are we talking about? Well, I talked about them in part zero. I think there's, oh, like there's eight. eight. Yeah, yeah like something eight. like that. Yeah. Oh, I see. But this okay. is the biggest one. This one is pretty much done. I done, just have right. to change the name from SSD to SIG So where are you but, hosting that? Where are you hosting well, that? It's probably going to end up on read the docs. Okay, yeah. So, I'm but you'll get to it from the GitHub. So if you're, um, yeah. If you're over here, this is um, the package. It, it's eventually going to be on here. So eventually, it's actually. So what I was suggesting, um, 
I would I would suggest if you if you don't mind I could help you with that actually. Do you want to sign up? Yeah, I, I would look at that. And do yeah, I'd like. Because I do most of this um, documentation. Okay. Projects and so you want to become a member is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. I'm I'm looking for people. Yeah, sure. I will look at the project and. Okay. Create a pool of questions. I mean, there's only two of us contributing, and that's yeah, us two. Yeah. Number three is on here. I gave him permission, but he hasn't done anything yet. Yeah. He's he's a computer science major, and his boss, he's interning at a company that does software-defined radio stuff for um, satellites, and he twisted his arm, and he's not he's not as reliable. I, I just said, okay, he can come and help. I need some documentation help. He doesn't know signals and systems, but he knows... He knows about documentation, so... Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. Okay. Put in a pull request. Okay. All right. And you're, you've done read the docs before? Well, yeah, so I, I actually maintain this software, so I'm working for one of these labs, and we basically... Um, I've got to... We, I have to do work on the doc string, too. The doc strings have to be yeah. formatted. Some. So... He wants to help with the documentation. Yeah. So I maintain. I'm staying for the sprints, but I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do. I'd like to work on this, but I'm not sure I'm competent enough to so um, I, I, run a team on this. I yet. maintain this software. Okay. We have a bunch of documentations up, and it depends on which uh, theme you want to follow, either the 2.7 or the 3.0. Okay. My the stuff I just showed you was written with a to but the we don't have stuff. the examples here. It's basically, it's basically the whole module being imported. Okay. You know? I'm, I use NumPy doc. NumPy doc. Yeah, that's the um, sifting function, oh, I oh, guess, for doc the, strings for um, NumPy oriented. I think stuff. we use the three uh, columns, just like the terminal. Documented just a little bit. Yeah, better. definitely. Yeah. definitely. I, I think for me, I just use the basic, uh, maybe the Google um, kind of documentation. But uh, it doesn't matter as long as the, the, the documentation is well scripted in the doc yeah. stream. It's all. Yeah. We can talk. Are, are you going to be leaving the conference? Or are no, you going to be the rest of the week? Up to the, end, up to the end of the conference. Saturday included? Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, well, yeah. maybe we should set up yeah. a. Yeah, we'll sprint on it or something. I don't know. I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm new to this. I would love to do that, but then I also want to do the um, what's this? The panda sprint. It's okay. Panda sprint. Okay. If I could get time and do that. Yeah. I just need to get it to trigger because I have the docs and everything. Yeah, you, you've already reject. Yeah, you you have it on read the docs, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just we need can to get it to trigger. Yeah, yeah. I, I could do that for you. It doesn't take long. Yeah. Well. I, my example was my editor was after me to get a chapter done, and I said I just did Sphinx documentation over the weekend. I started from ground zero. I had never done it and had it done. She wasn't impressed. Because <laughs> she wanted me to write chapters. It was like, whip, 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 whip. You got to get it done. So. All right, so I have to go, but. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you.
Um, 94.1. Now, it may have gotten unplugged and maybe needs to be reset again. I don't know. I haven't listened to it for a while. Okay. This thing's broadcasting at 94.1. Where did you get that breakaway? From SparkFun. SparkFun. Boulder, which is just up. Not really up the road, it's at the Boulder campus, but um, I've been to their place before. Yeah. This so is the power perfect thing for... No, I, I, I bought this. Yeah. yeah. I bought this because I teach a maker like mine who has in the fall. And when these things were announced in the spring, I just bought one and it sat there and I didn't know what to do. And I said, oh, I should use it here. It's got USB. It's got USB. What, what box? Is it has 3.35. Um, that's that's all there is in the box. Yeah. You can even put data through it. Well, I'm doing that. I'm using. I'll show you the other thing. Like through the jetboard. Well, I'm using a pin out. I can. You look on the screen, and I'll just show you what I've got going on in my Arduino. I don't know if Arduino lets me do this. Um, Arduino you know, compatible. Yeah. I don't really know what that means. Whatever that means. Oh. It might mean that there's a microcontroller inside. Yeah. 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 Those are the pins. Wow. That is actually really. So when you say this in Arduino, you mean inside the bread? Yeah. Okay. So this is the code that's running on the Arduino, is right? That is right in here. Really tall. And my data is being my data is being included from a header file that was written in Python. Um, and that header file is was written in Python, and we'll, that there's a notebook that showing how all that's being done. Have you ever played with MicroPython? No, but I have a book on it now because um, I did a book review for a publisher, and they let me pick from their catalog. And one of the catal one of the books I spent my funny money with is on that. So I'm kind of interested in that. Yeah, me too. I don't have the hardware though. Yeah, I don't have the hardware for it yet. All I know is what I've read and it's not very fast. So I like to do audio processing like I'm doing here. Well, I've got a, my younger brother who went to UW-Madison in chemical engineering and then got his master's at in Minnesota. His son went to MIT in ge geology and then went to Boulder for uh, his PhD, but he developed a set of sensors around Arduinos and using SparkFun stuff for remote field measurements of water flows and things and on trails and things. So he, he actually has a startup company with stuff that he's put together and he's not an electrical engineer, he's just kind of a, a maker guy. Okay, it's time to get started again. I was just, we'll get to this later, although this is um, what's running on the Arduino. Okay, part two, this is um, using Pi Audio for real-time DSP. There's two labs under this um, section, and then the very last piece is the RTL SDR and what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my eye on the watch and I'm going to ask my assistant to help me because I want to pull back from this. I can do this just as demos. I want to get a chance to do the series of experiments with the RTL SDR and if you don't have the hardware working fine I've got files for everything and you should be able to process the files statically in the notebook. I, it's a lot more thrilling to do a live capture um, but I've done this stuff before and I know that just processing a file is also fun. Capturing your own file, setting your frequency and that sort of thing is, is more exciting. But you'll have the opportunity and it looks like very likely every, anybody that wants one of these dongles will be able to have one is what I'm thinking right now.
if you don't want one, well, I'll find something to do with them. Um, okay, let's get going. So this will focus more on real-time DSP using Pi Audio. You've seen the application of the recording. You've seen the application of the playback. But the big deal to me is to be able to stream audio in and then um, do something with it, like filter it, and then send it back out again, all in real time. So this is a block diagram that appears in the book, just because it's generic enough that I decided I could use it. So this shows that we have an anti-aliasing filter and an analog to digital converter. Think of this as just a piece of your audio card. We're going to write our own code in here. And this can be split down the middle if all you want to do is receive and capture and, and post-process, or if you just want to transmit uh, or send samples out, playback, you can do some processing before you play it back. But then the other side of this is the playback, which is the digital, auto, digital to analog converter and a reconstruction filter to make sure you filtered properly. This is just part of the mathematics of it. Blowing up those two converters, uh, that's just not really relevant to this discussion, but it's in there. So the orange box is where um, I could have sworn I changed this and it didn't obey my command for continuous scroll. The orange box is where everything goes on that we're going to write in the callback. So that's what Pi Audio allows us to do. And Pi Audio is a fairly large package. It's based on Port Audio, which is a C++ based library. So um, if you put this on, did anybody install for Linux? You, you know exactly what you did then, right? You have a lot better idea of what happened with the Linux. I mean, you watched it fly by in the command window, but you were actually compiling and installing libraries. So you see it the most there. For Windows, it's transparent. It just, the wheels puts the binary on your Windows machine and it's there without even knowing it. Um, for Mac, Mac ports, or um, Brew does it the same thing. So it's got to get the, the um, port audio put on there. Port audio is used in a number of different applications. If you, if you ever play with audio, there's another number of open source applications that use port audio. I think there's commercial applications that use port audio because it's a cross-platform audio processing library and tries to have the same interface supported across all three main platforms. So that is what we do here, and this is just the Python take on it. The purpose of the external dongle, as I've already said, is just so that you can bring an input in of your own desire and not rely simply on the microphone input. This is my picture or block diagram to kind of stimulate your mind on what Port Audio or what Pi Audio is doing. It, I'm, it has a number of different modes, but I'm using probably the most sophisticated mode. It's called the, the non-blocking callback mode. And what do you suppose non-blocking means? People talk about this with Python for sure, but asynchronous, asynchronous and non-blocking would mean what? Your multitasking operating system of your computer is doing a lot of different things. So while audio is streaming through, it can still continue to do work. It will not stop it. But blocking mode is available with Pi Audio, where when it's doing it, it gets the focus and nothing else can really happen. I decided I wanted to work in this mode because that way I could run along something through and other things will continue to happen. Does that sound reasonable? I mean, that's my mindset at least. So what this requires then is a streaming source, which is what your A to D does, a callback function, which is where the real-time DSP takes place, and then a streaming sync. And then you've got a idle time in your code where you're just idling, and the multitasking operating system will go ahead and rob things out of that, but you still have to have this um, idle time, which in most embedded systems would be called the main, where you have a while loop sitting in there. And a while loop is where it just spins around if it's a dedicated microcontroller. In the case of our processor here, it's actually multitasking and doing things outside of the code that you've written. But that has to exist as well. And that's where it's just spinning. It seems like 
it's spinning and doing nothing, but actually because of the way this is set up, um, Python, I, my understanding is, is definitely yielding to other tasks that are running on your machine. But the important thing is, is when this gets set into motion, you create a stream object in Pi Audio, and that is what is going to set the heartbeat for this whole thing. The stream says that when a new set of samples are needed in the, in the form of a frame of samples, so many samples long, the callback function gets called and the source has got a, an input array sitting there ready for you to grab. You're going to do some work with it and then you're going to hand it back at the end of the, end of the callback to the streaming sync function and then it just goes into Pi Audio and you don't worry about it anymore because it's going to go send it out to your playback mechanism. This is kind of, uh, well, this is a picture of what the method looks like called stream, and I'm going to kind of buzz over this, but this just was my encapsulation of a sample file, and you can link to this, and you'll go right into the documentation for Pi Audio. It's called the wire callback example. So my code is based on that example. And inside of here, you can see the while loop while stream is active. And then, I'll just explain a little bit here, I count, each time a frame comes in, I have a counter counting up, or actually counting down, but it's counting up until I reach the maximum amount of time that I wanted to play back or stream for. And when that finally trips, then you go ahead and stop the stream. If you were to make this number really, really large, or in a sense, um, not even have a mechanism in the while loop for it to shut off, you would find out that it's kind of hard to stop it. Pi Audio wants to just keep processing samples. I got tired of having to restart the kernel all the time, and so I, I said I'm just going to put in a certain amount of time so I don't have to do that all the time. So the callback function is, is what I wanted to just isolate in this encapsulation with the, the class. One of the things about running the callback is that's critical is that you have to maintain state from one frame to the next with most DSP applications. If you're doing a very benign thing like just simply taking what comes in, sending it to the output frame by frame, there's no state that really has to be maintained. Now, that's not very exciting though. That's not signal processing. I'm not filtering or doing some manipulation of the samples. Most signal processing that we want to do, we have to do something with maintenance of the state. So we have to worry about frames-based processing as opposed to sample-by-sample-based sample based processing. And generally when we do filters, remember our filters use the present input and past inputs. So when you finish processing a frame and you got to get ready for the next frame to come along, there's been some history created by this first frame that you have to be able to move that forward as the history, as the initial conditions for the next frame. If you don't, things are not going to be smooth and continuous. So that's a requirement and that's something that I really can't train you on in just a couple of um, minutes or two. It requires some thinking, but so I'm not, I, we can't get really sophisticated with that at this point. But the good news is that for doing filters, scipy.signal.lfilter has a means of managing that. So when you create a filter, like in this example here, I'm going to create a bandpass filter. It's going to create the coefficients. The B vector comes out, or B array. I just set A equal to 1 for an FIR filter. And then I can create an array called ZI which is the initial conditions, and I'll set this equal to zero. So I'll just assume my filter starts from rest, and then that zi gets used in my callback, and it gets used in the callback uh, right down here. When I first call filter, I will pass in zi to the zi that's part of our filter, and then when this thing gets done filtering, it returns my filtered values, but it also allows me to pull out the final conditions, and I call those ZI, I can do that, right? I can use the same name. 
And then what I have to do to make this all work in the callback is I have to use some global variables. And I want you to not be fearful of the fact that global variables are okay, but they are okay. In real-time processing, we have to do something. So we have to have some globals. And the callback has this signature. I have to abide by this. And the return uh, has a signature that is part of pi audio. So I have to return in bytes the samples, and I have to return this message pi audio continue so it knows that it's still processing. I can't change that. So the global is really my only way out of this that I can see. But if you've got another idea, don't talk to me until after this, but I'd like to know. Um, so that's what that's all about. I had never used globals in Python before, but when I write this in C for my real-time DSP class, we use globals all the time. Um, it's just part of the way it works. So that, that takes care of it then. Um, I record a time tick when I enter the callback, and then I record a time talk when I leave. And this is emulating the idea of the logic analyzer like I talked about in part zero. I'm wanting to time my code to see how much time it spends in this callback. And if I was talking about an embedded system, this would be called an interrupt service routine. How many people have heard of that idea? So it's an ISR. The callback to me is analogous to an ISR. So if you like embedded systems, that's what, that's what the callback is to me. And if I wanted to time the time in the ISR, I would do that. And to me, it's just instrumentation that I threw in. Remember, I wrote this a little over a week ago because I was just hadn't had time to work on it. I'm pretty excited about it, and I just I'm scratching the surface of what I think it can do. And I know it can do great things, but I'm a professor, so I have to think, how can I get students to use something? So I'm trying to make something that's, that's got some nice features, but it's probably going to have to be changed. So once the callback is written, then right here in the notebook, you can write, you can create an object just to package things up using this DSPIO stream. And I, this name is the function name for my callback. This is the input index, the output index. And then this is an attribute that just tells what the capture buffer in the object should be doing. If T capture is zero, it's just going to record everything. But if you're going to run for minutes on end, you don't want to have this buffer just keep filling up space. So you can set this to so many seconds. And what it's going to do is just going to keep that many recent seconds. Like if you put in two seconds and you play for 30 seconds, it will attempt to just have the last two seconds in the buffer. That's the way I've written it so far. Uh, and then when you actually run it here, it just is going to start the stream up, start the capture, the input, filter, whatever I'm going to do, and then it comes to the output. Now, there's latency associated with this because the operating system is busy with other things. It's amazingly busy because people that write software have our computers doing lots of things that we don't even know about. Um, so the very first frame is going to take a while, and the frames are not short. The frames that they show examples of are like 10, 24 samples, which is very long. Um, so what does latency mean? Well, in terms of an embedded system, this is a picture from my real-time DSP notes, which came from another book, I think, that um, most real-time DSP systems think you think about using direct memory access, or DMA, processing, and you have a ping and a pong buffer on the input and a ping and a pong buffer on the output. So the idea is you're filling the ping buffer while the pong buffer is transferring in the processing frame. And then for us, this is what goes on when we pass into the callback. And when the callback is done, it sends out to, say, the ping buffer, but the pong buffer is streaming out to the D to A. I really don't know exactly how Pi Audio or Port Audio does this, but this is just, and this is how I'm trying to understand it. Um, I'm sure it's, it's documented somewhere, but um, I haven't been to Port Audio's site. 
So the frame length is going to be fairly lengthy because this says that the frame length should be on the order of twice the block size. So 2 times 1024, and then the period is um, 1 over the sampling rate, so that's going to be your latency. So this is just some other comments. Um, Everything's up to the programmer, and I'm not teaching you any of those details, but I do know that eventually we're going to run out of time, so Cython might have to be considered or something else that can run faster. And an algorithm that works well in sample-by-sample -sample processing, say an adaptive filter, might have to still do sample-by-sample -sample processing within the callback, because doing an update of filter coefficients once per frame might be too slow to keep up with the changing need for an adaptive filter. I'd like to try that, but I haven't gotten there yet, so I've got to get somebody to play around with it. Um, and my goal is to make this work with the RTL SDR for streaming end-to-end. -end. And there is a GitHub project where somebody has done something like this, but the co code is just a pile of stuff, and you know what it's like, you got to dissect it. So. Um, I haven't worked on that yet. So that's all there is to this. Um, now we're going to go over and play with some stuff. Does anybody have any questions? You see I'm not answering all the questions, but I'm just laying this out for something to play with. Um, but I'm pretty excited about it. It's not as good as what I do in my class. And I'll just show you. This is my website. Um, what I'm doing right now in my class, this is from the Colorado Springs um, Maker Fair, and I presented this um, ARM computing sponsored me to go to the um, ASWE conference last year and talk about doing real-time DSP with a, a board that's Cypress-based, Cypress Semiconductor. And this is kind of my setup for that. I've got the um, analog discovery that I showed you earlier. The board sitting on the right of it is a $50 um, ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller and I'm interfacing to it with um, a UART so I can talk to the board back and forth while things are running and then I have 3.5 millimeter adapters very similar to what we have here in our interfaces. And in this case, everything is written in C, but similar ideas apply. I just have a GUI slider control that I have written in another programming language that talks to the board so you can change parameters and run in real time. And I, the code is pretty straightforward in C. I have you know, a variety of examples. Um, this real-time spectrum analyzer actually sends the data back to the PC and the FFT is done, and ARM has a freely available signal processing library for their Cortex-M series. So let's just give you an idea that that option is out there. But Python is very nice for prototyping, and that's where I think this whole idea still gives me some hope or just speech processing. But remember, I, I said I like being a maker. So is it practical? I don't know. I really don't know, but I know Pi Audio is used for audio processing because I've been reading blogs about it, so it's not beyond the realm for sure. So we have real-time DSP, which gets into that. I have a notebook ahead of that called Static Audio Processing. The static audio processing is... Um, We did this already. I think I moved this from the other notebooks. We already did the static one. But another one, so we went through one that was one that I was supposed to throw away. So this notebook has got a better version of the notch filter. I forgot that I had moved this, so I brought up something that was old. Then we, we looked at this before the break. I just made a change when I was working on this yesterday. So this notebook is under part two. This is the correct one for the um, notch filtering, and we've been through this already. But then down below here, I was going to throw an adaptive interference removal. I didn't have, I decided to back off from that, but there's a function, LMS, an interference canceller, 
that's on the website for the dummies book. But then audio special effects is what I wanted to at least run. This is the idea of flanging. And flanging is, does anybody know what flanging is? Have you heard that term before? It's old. It's rock and roll old. And flanging is, comes from the era when things were recorded on tape. And the tape was turning and you had more than one um, recorder. This is my understanding of it. And flanging meant that you were putting your hands on the tape reels to slow down the speed and then let it speed up again. It was actually, my understanding, it's actually mechanical induced by putting your hands on the flanges of the tape reels. So that's where the term came from, I believe. Does anybody know? It creates this Doppler-like effect where you mix the flange than the on-flange signal. So the direct signal of the recording session would come across here, and then you would have this time-varying delay come up and mix it in. And it's like 70s era rock and roll is where it was used. But it's still used, I mean, it's, it's digitally available now, and it's still used by some recording artists. I don't know the details of it. But I have a function in here. Um, called time delay, where you get to put the samples in, and then you get to define a time delay function. So time delay takes in an array that can be a function of time itself. So the way to visualize that is I've got a long buffer of samples, and I feed them in at one end, and they propagate across over time from one end to the other, and I tap off in the middle of that delay line, and I actually, because they're all stored in here, I can do this causally now. I can move ahead in that buffer or move back in that buffer. So I can actually take time and move it backwards and forwards within this window. Does that sound mind-boggling? It's not, really. I'm just going to expand or compress the time axis, so I can do that with this. And this was... Um, kind of failing me last night, and I didn't start this notebook up. I'm going to be pretty quick on this so we can move forward. I actually got a bonus of time because I did something that I thought was in this notebook already, namely the, the tone jamming, tone interference idea. What am I doing wrong here? No, I'm doing the wrong cell. So I got to include that. Sorry about that. It's kind of loud. This is a C major chord made out of three sinusoids. So I'm using that as a music test. So um, it's recorded at 44.1 samples per second. And I'm now. Um, going to set this up for processing with a time delay. So it's computing right now. I guess it's done. So I put in a peak time shift of 50 samples. So I'm going to be moving plus and minus 50 samples of stretching and compressing the time axis by calling the time delay function here. And I have to add a few extra samples into the buffer so I don't bump into the ends of the buffer. I'm just trying to visualize if this buffer is holding all these samples. I don't want to try to go beyond the right side or the left side because I've only got so many samples to work with. And then I've taken the output back and I'm going to play it back through Pi Audio. And yeah, I figured this wasn't going to work. Okay, what I've got to do um, is just check to see what devices I've got on. I didn't put that block of code in here, so. 
The reason why I'm not playing it back through the audio player, because last night I was having problem, problems on my computer where it said it couldn't do it. It was getting um, upset with me, which was not good. But maybe I'll try that again before I go work more with Pi Audio. Um, or maybe I won't. I'm looking at my watch here. Um, does anybody really want to see this? If not, I'll move on to something else that does have Pi Audio in it. But what we, what we would be hearing is you'd hear the chord and you'd be hearing a wobbling sound in it like a Doppler would make the pitch go up and high, so it's sort of like a vibrato effect is what I'd be hearing. And then I had another sound file that I was going to play that does the same thing. And if you make this effect really slow, you get this whooshing sound of like expanding sound. It's hard to explain um, without actually hearing it, which is why I wanted to make you hear it. But I want to really go on to do the, the, the I.O. flow on here. I think I'd like to do those, just come back to this if we get time, because the receiver is going to be a lot, there's a lot of parts to that. So I'll just jump over here to the real-time DSP guy. And I'm going to be more careful about making sure my devices are here. So I'm going to, because I don't remember whether I had this running or not, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure I'm doing a restart of the kernel. This is for the sake of Pi Audio. Run this top cell. Get my graphics set up. And then my first line of attack is to do this. Okay, the devices were renumbered. That's why that code didn't work because I forgot I've got this HDMI here. I was trying to write to port 2 and that's the HDMI which is turned off. So something got, HDMI has no inputs on it. So I was doing something I can't do. That's why Pi, Pi Audio choked at me. I could go back and run that, but just be wary. You need, if you use Pi Audio, you have to abide by what this tells you. You can't do something that you can't do. So if a device doesn't have an input or doesn't have an output and you're declaring it, Pi Audio is going to choke on it. So I want to come in on my microphone, which is zero, and I want to go out on, no, I want to come in on my device with a line in that's going to come off my cell phone. So that's three. Help me now, remember. I want to come in on three, and I want to go out on my speakers, which will come out through this, your speakers, and that's going to be index one. So what am I doing? In on three, out on one. Sound right? It's frustrating because it changes. Every time you plug in or have different devices, it might change on your system. So okay, run the call back. This is going to be just a loop through. Um, so the loop through here is y is going to be equal to x. And I'm going to come in on 3 and out on 1. Is that what I said? I forget these things. So now what I got to do is plug in my signal generator with my cable. So I've got this little um, dongle on here for the external. And I'm going to put it into my cell phone. And I'm going to put some noise in it. So I'm going to do a noise characterization for five seconds. Sorry about the volume. I had this turned up too loud. White noise, is that harmful to your ears? Probably. Okay. I'm just going to record it at a lower level so it doesn't overload. So I captured five seconds. Um, these are pictures from last night, so I'm going to kind of 
First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the spectrum coming out of this. So that is the spectrum of my, of my output that was streamed to the speakers and captured in the data capture buffer. It's nice and flat, and that's saying that my flat white noise spectrum, all frequencies represented, is flat all the way out to the edge. It starts to roll off right at the folding frequency. I that's what I would expect. Um, I can go up my notebook where I do this capture buffer analysis, and I can say, let's look at the stats. So I have this little um, method called streaming stats. So this tells me, um, theoretically, a callback should occur on a good day because I'm requesting at 44.1 kilosamples per second. It should be 1024 divided by 44,100, or 23.2 milliseconds, on average per callback. So I do some stats on it. I find the mean, and it's dead on. Maybe this is a dummy's thing to do, but if the system was laboring and starting to miss some callbacks, I would expect this number to deviate. The average time spent in the callback is 0.97 milliseconds. So I feel pretty good about that. I know I can't use up all of that 23 microseconds to do DSP work before another callback comes because the PC, PC has other tasks to go off and do. But now what I can do down here is I can um, do this plot, which just tells me when the callbacks are occurring. So this is a timing diagram that says when the, you enter a callback, it goes up to 1. Leave a callback, it goes down to 0. So there's some initial latency in getting the first buffer into the callback. And then after that, it just starts kicking away here with making callbacks. That tells me that I'm keeping the frame going. If I zoom in on a callback, um, I can, the second plot window is just zooming in a little bit. I've got one around 55 or so, so I can set this up, go 50 to 60 or so. So that's just showing you that this width in here is how much time is being consumed for processing and input and output and everything that's in the callback. Is that kind of making sense? It's just telling me how much burden my algorithm is, is taking up. So kind of keep that in the back of your head about um, one millisecond is being used. So now what I'm going to do is um, introduce a filter. So I've got a couple filters that I've designed here that we've seen before. I've got this bandpass filter. Just have to import that. I've got this bandpass filter, and I also have a notch filter. Which would you like me to do first, or which would you like me to do? The bandpass or the notch? Yeah. OK. You excited about that? OK. So that one's already been instantiated. I didn't run the notch. So the bandpass has got a B in it. Um, now I could do this statically, all in Python, but I'm streaming it, so it's, it's actually live. So there's a significance to this. I'm actually doing it in real time. And then I'm capturing it and post-analyzing it. But when you hear it, you'll be hearing it live. I'm bringing it in on my cell phone, and it's coming right back out again. So we'll stream that through. Um, so what I have to do here is I have to put in A is equal to 1 because I, I don't have that in my FIR filter. I need to put in a 1, and then I need to create this initial condition. So I create that. Then I, this is my callback. And then um, I've got to change these numbers, otherwise I'll crash. I've got to make that a 3 and a 1. And my noise is still turned on. What do you think? Does that sound right? The noise has been filtered down to just a high frequency band sitting between 3,000 and 5,000 or 4,500. So it's going to have kind of that more hollowy sound. And if we go down here, um, and look at the spectrum, 
coming out. You're supposed to be excited about this. It looks just like the filter. As a matter of fact, the cool thing in Python is I can go ahead and uncomment this and I will plot my theoretical filter and it's perfectly matched. It's just my model, my theoretical response of the filter doesn't have that little roll off. It's part of the audio system roll off. But I don't know. To me, that's very nice. It's working. Um, it's floating point math, so it's got to work well with floating point math. But it is properly doing its thing. Um, I'm going to now turn that off um, so I don't get caught with an error with that going on. So now let's just um, look at the stats again and just see a question we'd have in our mind is we're doing a fairly large filter. We're doing a filter that has 193 taps in it. It's a pretty big size filter. So that uh, multiplies and adds. But we have a fast computer. So let's just look at the stats and just see what's really gone on. And we did that, so see what happened? It was 0.96 milliseconds, and now it's 1.21. So we have hardly put a dent into our processing time. So what's a takeaway from this? We've got an allocation of processing time just to get the buffer in and out and do some casting and recasting of it. And then we have that filter that's sitting in the middle. My takeaway is the filter is not really doing that much. It's taking 0.2 milliseconds approximately over the straight through. Anybody want to offer another thought on that so far? Why do I care? I want to do neat stuff and I want to make sure I'm not taking up too much time. So I just kind of want to diagnose what's going on there. Um, I could rerun this. And events are not following in this little window. Um, but I could zoom in on it, and I would see that on average it's a little bit wider. But something I didn't show you, that if I zoomed in on any one of these, I actually see they're not all the same. I could actually do a histogram on this if I wanted to and just see a distribution. It all has to do with what your processor is doing and what it's busy with. It's, it's doing a lot of other things. So it's, um, it's, it's just the way Pi Audio keeps track of things. So you, you're worried about missing the next frame. Yeah. So what, what if you, uh, because it's audio and you don't care, in some sense you don't care about the latency, what if you were able to buffer it and then use longer computations to achieve your effects and then pipe it to the output? That's, that's good, and, and that's, that's cool, because right here, let's see, I can make that number bigger right there. That would do it. That frame, uh, frame size, that would give me more time. That's, I'm working within the framework of Pi Audio, so it's doing the buffering management for me. I just get to tell it what size buffer I want. Is that fair? I've seen on the blog some people said, Pi Audio has so much blasted latency, I can't live with that. Um, well, I could, take the latent, I could take the buffer size down and see what happens. That was one of the things I, I wanted to have you guys do, but I want to go on to the radio stuff. But you can try that on your own and see how small you can make it before it starts crapping out on you. Eventually, it's going to fail if you make it too tiny, but the latency would come down. And then you could increase it to do more work and tolerate more latency. There's a company in town called Sure Audio in Colorado Springs. It's got a few engineers, and they've been talking to my students. I've been talking to them. I said in soundstage equipment where you're doing um, DMA and such for digital audio processing, a lot of digital audio is done right in the headset of performers and soundstage equipment. Does that make sense? I'm calling it soundstage, what is done in audio. Um, I said how much... Um, in a DMA buffer size, what buffer size do you do in, in your commercial grade stuff? He told me about 20 samples. That's all they can tolerate. It's very few samples in a buffer. 
for the, they, they don't want any more latency than that is what he said. It's very tiny. But the performance improvement and throughput with even that many samples, I guess, is significant. The, you can quote me on it, but I may remember it wrong because I asked him because we do that in my class and I said, how much can you tolerate? Um, so, and I assume that might even be at 96 um, kilosamples per second. I typically run at 48 kilosamples in my class with that board I was showing you. This is 44.1. We could run this at 48 too if we wanted to, 48 kilosamples. So it's just something to think about. I'll be interested in any feedback or if you want to contribute to this project, um, I welcome it because I'm, this, this is module is in its infancy and I don't know whether it's going to go or whether I'm just going to say I don't, I'm not excited anymore. Get what I'm saying? You get excited about something and then you kind of lose your interest. But I'm kind of excited right now. Okay, I'm going to do one more demo and then we're going to go on. Um, and I'd like to do um, the notch filter. So I will instantiate the notch. It's at 3000 hertz. So now what I have to do is comment this out so both the A and the B from the notch can get filtered properly. And then I'm going to take this up to 10 seconds. <clears throat> and I'm going to switch my generator from being a noise generator to being a sinusoidal generator. I'm going to make sure I can step the frequency accordingly. Okay. So I'm at what frequency? It's my notch at 3,000. Okay. And what did I do wrong? Okay, I've seen this happen before too. I don't quite understand everything about Pi Audio, but I find that after you run it once, you have to recreate the object because something gets set. Yeah. I didn't have it set to move fast enough. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay. 20 seconds probably wasn't long enough, so time is valuable. Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong block of code, I believe. Yeah, playback. Sorry about that. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight, three thousand exactly. It's gone. It stopped, but it started to come back up again. I guess 20 seconds wasn't long enough. Right in the hole, back out on the low side. So is that believing that it is doing it in real time? I'm just dialing around that notch. Okay, it worked. There's some things that I was worried that wouldn't work, so. You got to be really careful about getting the right index, though. So it's you know I've been getting comfortable with it. Any questions? We're going to move on to the radio. And if you need a if you need a pee, pee break, we can do that. But I'd rather just keep going. Ready to go? Okay. Sorry, maybe I used bad when I said pee break. You didn't like that, but. So I'm going to need RTL SDR1. I'm going to jump over to part three. I've got some lecture material in here, so um, 
if you really want to get into this and read a lot, I put this in the repository. This is lab six from my communications lab that really goes into a lot of detail. This is written for both MATLAB and Python. So that's just something for your own reading. Um, So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the theory. I'm just going to look at a few block diagrams and then we're going to jump over to that notebook so you can start um, playing with some things. So communication system block diagram for a digital comm system would look like this. We have a source that's analog. We might digitally to analog, analog to digital convert it, encode it with error protection like convolutional encoding I talked about earlier, modulate it. Send it over a channel, and a channel is free space, wired, optical, free space, optical, um, fiber optic, demodulate it, take it off a carrier, detect it, have synchronization, decode it optionally, and then if it's an analog message, take it back um, to the user in analog form. What we're going to be doing with the dongle will just be FM, analog FM, with the exception of the FSK. <clears throat> so we would skip over the analog, the digital, and the encoder, and then at the receiver we would skip over the decoder and the digital to analog because we just put analog modulation on the carrier. Analog modulation is still very popular. It's part of the legacy. Digital is more popular but you, you use what is appropriate for, your, for the task at hand. What I've done with um, what's in the Python um, digital com and other things is I've seen the spelling in there. I've done complete systems modeling for aerospace companies, very detailed high level modeling, um, part of hardware that's been built by a company. So that's just an example of things you can do with what's in here. So I didn't set something right. So carrier modulation that we're talking about is all based on a sinusoid at a high frequency. And then we have a choice of either amplitude modulating it by this factor or phase frequency modulating it by making this a function of the message. So we're going to be looking at FM. And FM means the derivative of the phase is made proportional to the message. And this didn't come out really well. I've got some formatting issues that I'll try to clean up. But this is what we're doing. The frequency deviation is made proportional to the message when you're doing FM. And this is just a little bit about how you have to build the demodulator, which is what we focus on here. How you build the demodulator is you want to get back to your carrier and a discriminator is a device that goes back in and tries to form something proportional to the original phase, the derivative of the phase of the received signal. And once it can get its hands on that, then you've got it. So the way that's done with the dongle is you look at the received signal in complex form, which is what we have in the dongle. It'll have a real and imaginary part, and I'll explain that in just a second. And you do something um, with that baseband signal that's centered around zero frequency, and that's something that I'm going to explain. So you're taking the derivative of this, and this is a complex variable, so you're, um, you want to get at the phase of that. So the phase is the arc tangent of the imaginary over the real. And if you take that derivative, this is something I'm guessing you don't have committed to memory when you took calculus, if you took calculus, but that's what the derivative is um, of the arc tangent. And this um, is very simple to implement in DSP as an approximation. You have a signal, a real part, times the derivative of the imaginary minus the derivative of the imaginary or the real times the um, 
imaginary part divided by that ratio. And you can implement that as a simple digital filter, and in Python, that's it right there. That'll do it. Um, that's the discrim function, which is an RTL SDR helper. So this is what the dongle block diagram looks like. It has a low noise amplifier. It has a complex multiply, complex sinusoid to do frequency translation. It has a low pass gain. And then it has an 8 bit A to C, A to D converter. And that outputs real and imaginary parts because there's this dash 2 all the way along here. It means that there's two signal flows, real and imaginary, because of this complex multiply. And then an interface through these Osmocon drivers to PC. And this was the stuff that you put on if you got this on successfully. So what does a complex multiply do? It takes a signal of interest. And you multiply by this. There's a Fourier um, transform theorem which says that it will take this and you can move it anywhere on these axes. And we're going to move it so that it's centered around zero frequency. And then there's a filter built into the dongle that acts as a band pass, or as a band pass but it's actually a low pass filter because we're centering it on zero. That's what you do when you tune the dongle by entering the frequency. And then this will be a complex signal that you can then process in a way that looks somewhat like this. This is the generic block diagram. You put some additional filtering in because the signal is coming in at a bandwidth that's wider than what you need. Then you reduce the number of samples by downsampling, and that's a block that's in signal 6 sys. And then you can process like a discriminator, and then you can low pass filter and count sample again. Finally, to get it down to 48 kill samples per second, and the raw rate out of here is 2,400 uh, kilosamples per second, or 2.4 megasamples. So broadcast FM mono radio would look like this. Just a couple stages of filtering and downsampling, and stereo is more complicated, and so on. And then another one is picking up the weather station here in Texas. Has anybody ever listened to NOAA weather? So we can receive 162.4. I don't know if down here, but up in my room I could last night. Um, and then we have the FSK signal, which is coming off the Arduino over here. So those are the three things um, that I'd like to kind of go for. So before we actually do that, let me just verify something. So I'm going to go over here to Applications. GQRX, I mentioned in the wiki. Um, SDR Sharp is an excellent application on the PC. It uses port audio for its audio, directly streaming. And Pi Audio is the Python version of port audio. So if this thing will launch up, I can't really change the size of this a whole lot, but. Um, This is 94.1 is where we're broadcasting at right now with our own station. If I turn off the FSK, I can put my cell phone in and play some music. It will be stereo. Um, this is just to verify that that's out there. But what we have to do is see what we can tune in. Um, Upstairs, I got a lot of signals down here. We don't get a whole lot, so I found one earlier. What was it, though? Everything we cataloged last night is kind of not easy to get down here. There's something. 90.5. Okay. Is that strong down here? Yeah. Okay. That's talk radio, though. That's national public radio, right? 
So this is probably the... It's down the street, that's why the signal's so strong. Okay, yeah. let's go with 89.5. I guess that is one we cataloged last night. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I can't run this while I want to use my device, but I'll, I just wanted to get, get our bearings up, 89.5. So you should be in the notebook um, called RTL SDR1. And we have options. I have an archive without a dongle, or you can use the dongle. So I'm going to load up here. Um, some graphics. And so I've got a number of different captures in here. This one is in the archive capture 98.9 is what this was in Colorado Springs. Um, like I said, I have a number of captures. So I'm using the WAV file format to save the real and imaginary parts. So that's what these functions are, complex to WAV and WAV to complex. It's just a reuse of the WAV format where I can have real and imaginary in place of left and right and then keep the high sampling rate. So if you wanted to do a capture right now, um, what we would do is I would set it to a, a known good station, which was 90.5? 89.3. Okay, why didn't we get that one last night? I hear my clean KCME with a trumpet player. 89.3, right? Is that right? 89.5. Okay. So it's capturing right now. It's capturing five seconds. And it's done. And if I go right down here um, to look at the spectrum of it, that looks a little bit like we saw in the application. It's sitting there. Um, I wanted you to write receiver code and I was going to let you redesign my receiver code but because I knew I might be in a bind at this point I have it encapsulated into the RTL SDR um, helper function already for mono and stereo both. I was just playing it safe. You can study that code but we could start writing it. I'm just, I know it's getting late. I haven't eaten my snacks yet. Um, haven't gone to the bathroom either, but I'm okay. Uh, how would you like to proceed, though? Um, pointers and things. We've got a number of different apps to do. We've got about a half an hour left. Do um, you want to just play with what I've got built and load it and run it and try some different things, try some different stations? Um, I want to point some things out to you, too, that I didn't really take a look at over here. but. Um, There's some pictures in here that, where is that picture? Hmm, there's a picture missing. Well, I can get back to it though. Does anybody have anything in particular? You, you see from what I'm looking at, we can do mono, stereo, we can do the FSK, which is a digital scheme, and we can do weather radio. The weather radio is in, RTL is in, um, the other notebook that I have in here, the one that's called RTL SDR2, has got the weather radio in it. And I'm not sure whether that one's completed or not, but it's pretty straightforward to design it. Uh -huh. Something I wanted to show you, though, that the picture I thought was in there, I don't know where it went to, but it's in this, it's in this PDF for sure. My lab notebook is um, when you demodulate using our discriminator an FM radio station, you find out that it's not as simple as you might think it would be. When an FM radio station is demodulated, you find out that it's actually multiplexed. 
And by multiplexed, I mean there's multiple signals that come out when you unpack it and demodulate that FM with this discrim function. You will see left plus right audio down at baseband, where you can listen to it on a simple radio. You will get a pilot at 19 kilohertz. And then you will have another form of modulation called double sideband, centered at 38, that contains the left minus right information. And the 19 kilohertz pilot can be doubled to 38, and then coherently, remember we talked about synchronization and so on, that's an important part in stereo. You modulate this coherently, and then when you add and subtract left plus right with left minus right, you can then matrix out left and right. Now you're saying, that seems kind of cool. Guess what? It's technology that's from the 50s. It's very old. But it was the idea of engineers make something legacy, and we made things legacy. I mean, mono to stereo. And then there's another service at 57 called um, RDS, radio data service. This is where you get the other information. It's a binary phase shift keying at that many bits per second, which happens to be exactly three times 19 kilohertz. So this can be coherently demodulated. Um, with that same pilot, and you can get the bits back, and you can tear that down too, and other things can be up there. So it's kind of cool. It's unwrapping a package and seeing what's inside. I don't know if this excites you or not, but it excites me. It's like, oh, it's not that simple. I can go open this package up and discover. So what what do people use these dongles for? What else do they use them for? Not a not a. It's a criminal activity, by the way. <laughs> Okay, what's another criminal activity that you may have heard about for these dongles? Well, um, how about sitting and listening to people approaching their car with their key fob? Because that you can tune this in. Um, I don't have one in my pocket. But people use that for deciphering and breaking into cars. I mean, it's sad to say, but it's true. Your car's not really as secure as you might think because you can intercept and then you can... Um, mimic that. This does not transmit, but you can record a record, capture, and then tear it down and figure out where it is in the sequence of codes. So I just thought I'd point that out, uh, this makeup of it on here. So the cool thing here on this station that we just captured, let's see if it has RDS, let's see what else is going on, so we can go through this demodulator for our capture, it's done. I come out with the demodulated that I can play back, but I also come out with the baseband, which has that spectrum picture that I was just showing you on it, so we'll look at that. And we didn't capture much of anything in this case. It's not too exciting. So if we go to play it back, um, I overwrote my clean KCME. We might not even have captured anything. We didn't get a very good quality capture. So let me just take one of my recorded captures, the one that I had over here originally, um, load it back in. Um, this one was saved already, so I just need to go in here and put in capture something. Oops, it's not getting the right thing. Take a look at that spectrum. Um, that was saving it. No, that was playing it back. Oops, I just wiped it out. I did the opposite of what I wanted to do, so I just lost it. Okay, how do I get that back? Fortunately, I have another copy of it. If you want to follow along and do what I just did, but don't make the same mistake I did, um, I've got it in here in the repo version. I'm working with the 
non-repo version right now. So now I'll just do this. Okay, so this is a signal I captured um, in Colorado Springs at 98.9. Now I'll send that into my DMOD. Um, I'll just play it fair, capture, save it off into that. Now I'll unpack this, look it at the um, CBB, and this is kind of what we saw in the idealized picture. This is the left plus right down in here. There's a 19 kilohertz pilot. This is the double side band, left minus right, sitting among 38. And this little thing in there, that's the RDS, radio data system um, spectrum. And if I go down here to listen to it, oops, didn't put the right one in there. And that was the other one, so. Capture. Okay, that's the mono version of it. Um, so if I want to do stereo, I have to first lock onto the carrier, and I have something called a phase lock loop that does that. I do some pre processing, but this picture, I'm not going to run this again, but this picture just shows you that I practice first pre-filtering around the neighborhood with a bandpass filter, the 19 kilohertz pilot tone, and then I locked a phase lock loop onto it, which is built into the RTL module. So it's the pilot phase lock loop. I give it a center frequency. I give it some attributes, which students of phase lock loops in COM theory would study. Um, again, just part of the hands-on with the tool tools that I've given you. And then I look at the phase and the loop goes through a transient when it's first acquiring from the capture record and then it settles out around zero, which is what a tracking loop should do. And then when I want to play it back and use it for demodulating, I would want to take the cosine of that phase and double it so that I'm actually making it, instead of being a 19 kilohertz signal that I, I'm tracking and following, I want it to be double that for demodulation up at 38. And this picture here just shows the bottom plot of it locking onto the fact that it's centered on 38 and I've just looked at two different variations. I was trying to get the best recovery. So then I went on further and how I built my demodulator that's in the module and just explain here how I designed some filters using the tools we were looking at earlier. The fire window is, not, is actually built out of signals filters. I was going to have you rebuild these filters using my um, package or my module, FIR um, helper and, and IIR helper. So I was going to have you change the filter designs, but this is how I built it originally. So the blue one is for capturing the left plus right and pro post processing. This is going to sit around the pilot and then this one is going to sit around the left minus right to just kind of pre-filter it so I can eliminate some of the extra spurious. And that's built up inside of this. Um, We destroyed this earlier, so we'll just use the one we were using, which was capture here. This will take longer to run because there's a phase lock loop and other a lot of other DSP going on here. And it's not very optimized at all. It's done. Um, now, before I do this, what I want to do is make sure you can get this in your memory for a second. Let's play back the mono version. And 
and actually I should have saved it under the other name. So I ju we just heard the stereo version. Rats. Um, so what I need to do is quickly rebuild this. I make the, made these mistakes a lot when I was doing this stuff, so I'll just demodulate it and I'll call this one mono. Then I'll play back the mono version. In theory, this is the stereo version, but you know it might not sound any different. I don't know how the speakers are set up, or maybe the speakers are not really stereo in here. Yeah, I don't. You notice it best on your PC because if you stick your head right down next to your speakers on either side, you'll hear it be a little bit noisier, but it'll have more of that spatial sound. Whereas the mono is kind of just. You know, mono, it doesn't sound like it has a spatial effect to it. So you would be able to hear that. And yeah, I hear the trumpet again, so that's a better thing to go off and do. Okay, I'm going to keep going. And we'll go look at the last one. And the last one is. Actually, there's two more. There's the SDR2, and then there's the Arduino FSK. Um, SDR2 has got the weather in it, which, honestly speaking, let's find out if we can even get the weather. Well, let's put ourselves up to a challenge. If we were really daring, we would just try to demodulate it straight here in the notebook, and I know what frequency it's at. If we wanted to be um, less daring, we'd go to the application that somebody else wrote, not in Python, and use that spectrum and just see if we can get it right away. What do you want to go for? Just try to capture it right away in the blind, like being blindfolded. Just think that it's there. I happen to know that it's at um, 162.4. So what I would do in order to do that capture in Colorado Springs, the one I get is at 162.475, so I would do the capture here. Got to launch this notebook, though. And um, so we're pulling in five seconds. And by the way, if you've been wondering about how big this data is, if you look at one of these files, at 2.4 mega samples per second, at 8 bits per sample, times 2 to be a real and imaginary, um, or 16 bits per sample, it's pretty large. It's like 80 megs or something for 5 seconds of data. What do you think about that? I call that big data. But I know not in the sense of data science, but um, there's a lot of data that gets cranked out from a DSP and gets managed. So, okay, we just did that. Um, we just did the capture. If you look at the spectrum of it, um, I don't see anything there. There's nothing there. There's a little tiny blip. I bet we won't be able to get it downstairs. It was pretty strong last night. Um, I do have a capture, though, as a sample, um, but I got to make sure I don't wipe it out. So, but let's just go on to demodulate it. So we have a narrower bandwidth demodulator because this information is not wide, a wide spectrum like stereo is, FM stereo. So I just put the function in here. This one was built right in the notebook. And I'm going to write this as TX demod. And I'm going to look at the spectrum of it. I'm guessing there's nothing but noise there, but we'll go look at it. Or listen to it.
Okay, we'll have to take your dongle and try it up in your room or something where you're up a little bit higher. Let's just validate that this is indeed working now and bring in this capture from here. There, it's pretty strong in Colorado Springs, the one I was getting, but I wasn't else, I was not in the basement of my house. So, um, let's demodulate that. Take a look at the spectrum again. It's a very narrow spectrum. It's, it's not even out to 10 kilohertz. It's only about 4 kilohertz because this type of signal is about telephone grade quality, only about 4 kilohertz wide. So it's not really great sounding. Oops. Uh-oh. I left Texas in here. I'm thinking something might not, I might have wiped something out again. So that's, that worked. I mean, that was just an archive, but this worked last night. You'll just have to trust our honor. Oh, we yeah, we did it. It worked. I mean, I come into a new area, you got to scope out the spectrum and know what's available. So. Okay, one, one last thing, um, Arduino. Okay, and this one started out with me needing to encode a message. So um, I decided when I did this, I was going to record my speech, and I recorded that speech that we heard earlier of um, SciPy 2017 digital radio. That was what I was going to transmit, and you were going to parse that out. So I did all that stuff in here, but then I said, okay, I need to add to that message a code so that you can synchronize to it, because you'll pick it up asynchronously, and you'll need to be able to parse out using a cross-correlation between the transmitted known pattern and the received to find out where in that stream of bits is the start of the message. That's called frame syncing, and it's used all the time. Correlating is used all the time, just like correlation in statistics, but correlating waveforms changes over time. If the waveforms align, you'll get a strong correlation. If it's skewed, you won't get a correlation, so you can figure out the time of arrival, and that's how GPS works. And satellite ranging and a lot of other things. So so that was, um, that's what my SciPy 2017 digital radio looks like. That's the, the record of that. So I used a set of functions that we haven't even touched um, where I can take an analog stream and encode it into bits and it's called PCM encode which stands for pulse code modulation, and there's a PCM decode, and there's another notebook out here that we haven't even looked at that has all that stuff in it. Um, so then I wrote a header file in C and had that stuff go into the header file. But then I turned things in, around and I said, let me just write a code. So I just said, let me, um, oops, I didn't load digital com. Got to load that one in somewhere in here, I think, or what, I guess I should look at the error message and see what it is. Okay, I created that earlier. There it is. Okay, I just created from digital com a pseudo-random sequence that's six created from a six element shift register, which means it creates a two to the two to the six minus one or sixty three bit pattern. Um, so I then write a header file right here. And okay, I didn't load its header is not defined. Its header was maybe right here. Yeah. 
and I write a header file, and that header file, it's not quite displaying here properly, but let's see. The size of it was, is what was messed up, so. There, I just shrunk this down a little bit so we can see it better. I wrote a, a header file as in, as, as in a C header file, and this just defines a variable and the data bits and so on. And so those 63 bits are these guys right here, and then I move that over to my Arduino code. And in the Arduino, I'm importing this header file, and then I have a timer set up in here that I interrupt at a rate that allows me to, down below here, send those data bits out of a pin on the Arduino, and I put on the Manchester waveform encoding. So I have a timer fire at twice the clock rate that I want to send at, and then it, it holds it for that half bit period, a high, and then it goes low, and then for the opposite bit, it flips it around. So I'm encoding it with that Manchester pulse shape we looked at earlier. And that's what's going on in the code right here. So it's a biphase plus one or a zero, and I'm just flipping it back and forth. And that is coming out on the Arduino on some pins that then are wired over to the analog input on the modulator where I could actually pipe stereo music through. Instead, I'm just sending ones and zeros into it to modulate it. And we were listening to that a bit ago, remember? That um, churning sound that we heard? You want me to do it again or just remember we did that? So this is what the FSK capture looks like then when I demodulate it. I did it here with a capture of eight seconds. But I'm cheating. I'm using my archive because we are almost out of time. So I, I stored that away from a capture, but the signal was very strong. You were hearing it. Do you want to hear it again? Because I don't think you're remembering what we heard. I don't have to use the SDR. I can just go and run it again. Is that 94.1? There. So that's what it sounds like with that biphase shift keyed, I mean biphase encoded and then FSK. So I'm flipping the tone frequency back and forth. Um, and that's what is being received by the RTL SDR, what it, it did pick up. And I could do another recording of that because it's nice and strong because it's, it's right there. My receiver's right here. But you can probably receive this too if you, if you go run this code right now, except you have to change this from 106.9 to 94.1. But I, rather than risk that glitching, I'm just going to work with what I loaded in. Um, there's the spectrum zoomed in. And then I have an FSK demodulator running right here. And then I can go demodulate it. So the FSK demodulator is in the notes, but it's a similar architecture of filter, downsample. I guess I didn't explain downsampling, but it's just throwing away samples, just like we did when we did the speech um, speed up. There's the FSK signal, and these are the humps on the spectrum, kind of like you saw, those of you that did the Manchester pulse, and then it trails off into noise. But these are the main pumps on the Manchester. And notice at DC, it's pumping down. Remember the few of you that showed me that? You're still here. So now I go through um, a bit synchronizer. There's what the data looks like. I have to do something called a matched filter to match to that biphase pulse. And that's the second waveform. And then the bits 
I make a decision on them using a comparator or a sign function in Python. So I'm running just the sign, S-I-G-N. And because of the clock, local clock and that transmit clock not being the same, I can't really make a decision uniformly across this data. The, this is actually asynchronous. So I take that data and I retime it through an algorithm in the module called SCCS BitSync. So it's finding the bit edges and then it's retiming the data and clocking it out as just ones and zeros. So this is the slippage over the time interval where it, in, in a window from 0 to 63, or, or not 63, but 0 whatever the, the resolution is of my sampling rate, where the clock is sliding over time, where at times it's, it's changing and then it wraps around. So this drift here is an indication that the clock's not being synchronous, and this is tracking that. And then down below here, I use a little utility called strips um, to just plot the received bit pattern. And this is 63 bits, and then it starts over again because I'm just sending the same pattern over and over again. So I'm, this is the capture, and this is the correct PN code. So it is being demodulated correctly is what I'm telling you. You have to believe me on that, but a character of a six bit pseudo noise code is that you're going to have six ones at some point in the sequence and you're going to have five ones and four ones and not, none of these things repeat more than one. So it'll be 63. There should be one spot that's exactly six and that's it right there. So it does indeed work, um, but it's a lot of work to get it to this far. I mean, to send the message I wanted to send, it becomes very large. Um, my speech becomes quite long. There's a number of things you haven't seen that I wasn't able to show. Um, we're just out of time though, and my brain is losing a little bit of its focus. Four hours is kind of wiping me out, but I actually don't feel as bad as I thought, but guess what, I'm running on adrenaline too. That kind of kicks in after a while. What questions any of you have? I'm going to be here all the way through um, Sunday afternoon. So I'd li actually like to get a lot more work done on this, but I don't know when it will happen. I'm, I'm, this will be the first time I've been here for the coding sprint part because I figure now that I'm a package developer, I should understand how this part of the process works because I'm, I need to get more engaged in it. Um, where is this going to go from here? I don't really know except I'm going to continue to use it in my teaching. But I'm interested in having feedback, of course, and, and support if anybody wants to support. Do we have the book ready to announce? We have 10 people, and we have 15 books. Wow. So, so everybody can have a book. So. OK. Well, can you still generate a random number just for fun? Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, so yeah. the fact that you didn't win something makes you feel cheated, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can relate. Really I can really 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 my gifts, so yeah. I hope it's pretty much. <laughs> Would you like me to pipe some music through my transmitter over here? Probably not, but I figure, you know, best way to get some of the basics. People are using the reverse end twister because in that case, they're not going to recur until like 2 to the 1927. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Has anybody been listening to this guy? I've been listening to it for a little while. Because I'll put some music on it if you want to hear me transmit some of my uh, music. But if not, it's not that big deal. Do you need these back? Um, the dongles? No. I do, I do want my cables back and these guys back for sure. Especially that one. This is a really nice one. I like Yeah. You can have it. Play with it. You can, if you don't even want to do anything, you can just use one of the apps like I was using. It's, they're fun to play with, even if you're well, thank you for coming. You've been pretty gracious with me.